Hello, my fellow Westorians. Welcome back to Fire and Blood content. We've got a really good one for you today, and I'm excited to get into it. it could, I could use a distraction. We got some bad news about our house lately. We might have to replace our roof, which is just no fun at all. So this is a great escape from thinking about real world things like that. Let's talk about, well, I'm going to start off with a short list of things to keep you excited. Excited about what? Well, let me read you the list and you'll know. Let's start with High Priest of R'hllor, Benero, promising eternal life to followers of Daenerys, Targaryen. Azora High Reborn, that's what he's calling her. Is he, or is she rather? Hmm, probably, maybe. What's about, what's up with that eternal life thing? Makoro, though, not, he of the accurate prediction, unlike Melisandre, who also isn't fully explored. What about Mac the firearm that Victorian got from Makoro? What the heck is up with that? Dragon riding, dragon taming, the dragon horn, the real Euron, the horn of winter, while we're talking about horns, young Griff, Grayscale, Stoneheart, Nymeria, I could go on. For example, I didn't mention Benjen or just about anything to do with Bran or the others. Okay, so I did go on. <laughs> the point was to name a bunch of things the TV show didn't spoil or only partially spoiled, or in some cases didn't touch at all, like a shy Dorn, Howland Reed, Valyrian Steel. Oops, I went on again. It's just it's just too easy. Anyway. I didn't actually sit down to make a full comprehensive list of all the plot lines we still have left, but in just taking a stab at it, I underestimated how much was left for us to learn in the remaining books, and I thought it was a lot. Don't get me wrong. I didn't expect it to be a short list, but it was even bigger than I thought, and like I said, I didn't even finish making the list. So my fellow historians consider that, like me, you too may be underestimating just how much the show left untouched, or at least touched too shallowly to matter. Sure, they revealed some whoppers, but major fun times are ahead from the whoppers they didn't reveal. And hey, maybe some of those whoppers will turn out to be misdirection, you know? Definitely. And also, we really haven't considered how the end of the show impacts things with Fire and Blood also considered. Fire and Blood and the TV show don't overlap hardly at all, if at all. But the two confer with A Song of Ice and Fire proper. They meet kind of in the middle. And... They have a huge impact uh, individually on our picture of A Song of Ice and Fire. Now, I'm not going to talk about TV spoilers other than to point out a few things like this that they didn't spoil. Nothing specific, just things that we didn't get a full picture on or things in that category. And this theme that we have for today's episode, this topic, it fits in that pretty perfectly. There's basically, I mean, we learned some things about the Faceless Man. We learned some things about the House of Black and White, you know, but... Didn't really get into that much depth of the way the Faceless Men work and all the other ways they can impact the plot. I mean, and the Iron Bank, too. I mean, they were in the show. Both of them were in it. But mm, I think you probably all agree with me that there's a lot more that the show didn't touch on. Because the Faceless Men and the Iron Bank and, and the Sea Lord of Bravos, another topic we're going to get into today, have been foreshadowed or suggested to matter in a lot of ways in the books. It, not just to matter, but to get involved in a lot of different ways. And the show only captured a little bit of some of those ways, if if uh, if only one. For example, there's plenty in A Song of Ice and Fire to suggest that we'll see a major plot impact on a large scale, like the Iron Bank's backing of Stannis. We've just begun to see how that will go. Hey, maybe Stannis will just die in the first few chapters of The Winds of Winter, and that backing won't matter. But it will. Because they'll back someone else if Stannis dies. They're not going to be like, oh, well, Stannis is gone. Let's just sit back and wait to see what happens. They're going to back someone because they have to get paid. And the only way they get paid the debts that the crown owes them is to back the eventual winner. So they have a big stake in what happens in Westeros. And, of course, let alone the idea that there's a relationship between the Faceless Men and the Iron Bank. This is something that the... Fire and Blood did take us a little further on. And like I said, we're going to talk about the Sea Lord in this episode. The TV show didn't mention the Sea Lord at all. I mean, completely, un completely unspoiled in that regard. So uh, we've got a lot to say about that. And you know the Sea Lord's important because he pops up right away in A Game of Thrones. Everywhere from Danny's birth with the Red Door, you know, staying in that house, to the secret pact he oversaw with Doran Martell and uh, Viserys and Arianne's potential marriage that never did happen and 
a couple other things too. That's not even a full list. So there's a lot to say about that. And, and Fire and Blood gave us a lot more. And well, hmm, maybe some of these things we don't have as strong as an idea on as we think we do. In other words, maybe some of these things are more important, or maybe they have more to do than we thought. In other words, well, in other words, we'll see as we go through this episode, you may find things that you hadn't given full uh, thinking to or full consideration to, as well as a few tidbits that I think a lot of us overlooked. In going back through Fire and Blood, I definitely found a few things that are going to be really interesting this episode that I think a lot of people overlooked. And let's go. Let's have fun with that. First off, a couple of announcements. Uh, shout out to Jeff Gnarly, History of Westeros' first sword. Or our first sword. And that's, yeah, lo the long snapper Jeff, Jeff Gnarly is our first sword. Absolutely. And our Dragon Rider patrons, we have Telenius the Talon, King of Gagossos, Rider of Telerius, a red dragon with scales, horns, and talons of midnight black. And looky here, new art for Telerius. How cool is that? Very awesome. Fierce looking dragon, isn't he? Yeah, and this piece is by Aligar, who has done a piece for us before. And then the next piece we have is also new. Yeah, Robert the Force of Houth Ardeacor, burned king of Blazewater Bay, rider of Atroxus, the black dragon with bioluminescent spots like smoldering embers, and a banded blue tail, looking fierce as well. Two new dragon art at the same time. That's cool. Everything coming together. And that piece is by Luke Fitzsimons. Mm -hmm. Thanks to Ashe, as always, for running production and keeping us informed of these artists as well. Very cool. All right. Uh, as always, you can ask questions. We'll be taking questions throughout each section. There's basically three sections of this episode. Face, we're going to start with the Faceless Men. Then we're going to roll in the Iron Bank, kind of look at them both as a whole, Iron Bank uh, as, as a separate piece, and then the two together. And then we'll roll in the Sea Lord, who kind of presides over them both as the leader of the city, and figure out how that looks in terms of A Song of Ice and Fire and as the three roll together. Because, hey... The Titan has three heads, right? Isn't that how that saying goes? S Faceless Man, Iron Bank, Sea Lord. That's the, yeah, that's the way it goes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Only other announcement I have for now is to point out that Valar Reredus is ongoing. We're through the first four episodes of 11 for A Game of Thrones. We're about to do number five this Sunday. We're having so much fun with it. It's really fun going back through the books and finding all these things we missed looking at with all, all the new information we have from the end of the TV show, from Fire and Blood and all these other things. It's great. It's, it's, it's almost like reading a whole new series. Now, interestingly, well, actually, I should say, and those are every Sunday at 3 Eastern, except for the occasional miss where we're out of town for travel or conventions or what have you. But this next Sunday is, 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 is uh, going to be part five. And then we'll, we will have a week off for Con of Thrones, and then we'll be back with a couple more. And uh, yeah, so please join us for those or catch the replays on your favorite podcatcher or here on YouTube. So interestingly, as I said, the Titan has three heads. Each of the three parts is kind of like a typical power center for just about any society. And well, starting with religion kind of makes sense, even though calling the faces men religious is, well, they're not, the, they are religious, but it's definitely not your standard kind of founding religion. And to be fair, it's not the religion that people in uh, Bravos followed for the most part. Bravos is a city of many religions. As we know, it was founded by escaped slaves, and each of those slaves carried their own beliefs from their original homeland. And well, those kind of became a melting pot in Bravos. But amongst that melting pot is this standout entity that doesn't exist anywhere else. And yes, though it was founded in Valyria amongst the mines, well, it's come a long way, hasn't it? So we're calling them the religion, even though they're kind of more like a death cult, which is maybe that's stretching the definition of religion, but uh, whatever. In terms of the mysteries behind their origin and what else is up with the House of Black and White, how Arya will interact with them and vice versa, Fire and Blood doesn't give us a lot. In other, and that's why this was kind of pointing out at the beginning how the Faces Men can impact the plot in a lot of different ways. Of course, Arya is a huge part. That's our up close and personal view, but as I also said, they can impact the politics, and because of Jake and Hagar being in the Citadel, well, we'll get that to that. We'll get to that too. But it's it's another example of something else they're doing. Because a, a faceless man in the Citadel, he's probably not out to murder someone, even though he did murder poor Pate. 
It doesn't look like he's in the Citadel to, to kill off some Archmaesters. That doesn't seem like his purpose. So there's a lot of ways. So that gives you just an idea right there of something besides the House of Black and White and their lore and how Arya is going to be impacted that it's going to matter in a lot of other ways. So when wars can start or end based on the death of a claimant, it's not hard to see why super assassins are relevant. They're mentioned fairly early in the series. Uh, during the scene when Robert demands assassins to be sent to kill pregnant Daenerys, Ned resigns in protest, of course, but faceless men are mentioned in that scene and then repeated afterwards. And so the idea of the faceless men coming for Danny has been around a while, and here's where we have to consider it again. As we'll move forward here, we'll consider maybe them coming back for her. Here's a little quote. Though the narrow sea lay between them, the two Rogares died within a day of each other, both under suspicious circumstances. Drizenko perished first, choking to death upon a piece of bacon. Lisandro drowned when his opulent barge sank whilst carrying him from his perfumed garden back to his palace. Though a few would insist that their deaths were unfortunate accidents, many more took the manner and timing of their passings as proof of a plot to bring down House Rogare. The faceless men of Bravos were widely believed to have been responsible for the killings. No more subtle assassins were known to exist anywhere in the wide world. But if indeed the faceless men had done the deeds, at whose bidding had they acted? The Iron Bank of Bravos was suspected, as was the Archon of Tyrosh, Recalio Rendun, and various merchant princes and magisters of Lys, known to have chafed under the velvet tyranny of Lysandro the Magnificent. Some went so far as to suggest that the first magister had been removed by his own sons. He had sired six trueborn sons, three daughters, and sixteen bastards. So skillfully had the brothers been removed, however, that not even the fact of murder could be proved. Okay, so that's a quote from pretty late in Fire and Blood, and it tells us a lot. There's a lot of different things we can extrapolate from just this quote, even though we're not directly talking about the Rogari uh, Spring, which we will talk about some other time. But of course, it's going to come up a bit because the Iron Bank versus House Rogari is a pretty big part of this, and the Iron Bank is a big part of this episode. Now, of course, the one of the takeaways from this scene is how subtle this is, and the timing is so perfect. It's almost like it's so well done that it kind of proves that the Faceless Men were involved, even though there's no direct evidence. On the other hand, the way this is written, it's almost like, well, who else could have done it so well? Who else would be involved? And, of course, it makes sense that they were involved because of the situation. Well, not necessarily because there's something a mercy that needs to be given. It's not necessarily a faceless men reason, but it is a bravosi reason, meaning, well, the Iron Bank has been the top bank as long as they've been around, mostly. And it's said that they're more powerful than all these other banks put together. So the fact that the Rogari Bank passed them for a little while was very stunning. So you can really see where their motivation would come from to get back in the top spot. And it was savage the way they did so, if these rumors are true. Now, if we're thinking about these, the timing of these deaths, like I said, Drazenko perished first. It says he choked to death on a piece of bacon. Like, well, damn. <laughs> and the other guy, Lisandro, his opulent barge sank whilst carrying him from his perfumed garden. And because the time, like I said, because the timing was so perfect, so lined up, hmm, it's very suspicious. It's almost like the opposite. They're like... Well, it's so smooth and subtle that it becomes suspicious because it's so smooth and subtle. But again, no way to prove it. I so, think it's interesting. I mean, there are other assassin groups that are pretty subtle, like the Sorrowful Men. Yeah. But it makes so much more sense for them to hire the Faceless Men, obviously, what with not even hire, you know, and all that. But, you know, you would the history books might have speculated on that as well. Yeah, I agree. And it's interesting, too, that this is a kind of a clue, maybe the biggest clue we have of the Iron Bank and the Faceless Men working in concert. That's, I think, maybe the biggest takeaway from this quote. We've always suspected it, right? The Iron Bank has been around since the beginning of Bravos. The Faceless Men have been around since before the beginning of Bravos, but they settled in Bravos, so to speak, that's where their temple is. And both of the early days. So they're both part of the founding of Bravos. 
And so they're they're obviously aware of each other. They've obviously done business before. But how close do they work? How close do they exist? What connections do they have? Uh, is it is it just a you know professional courtesy that they work together, or do they have like you know special deals? You get discounts for yeah, frequent if, murders. Yeah. If the Iron <laughs> Bank snaps their fingers, will the faceless man follow? Yeah. Or do they have uh, you know are they more equals? It's a very good question, and, and this gets us a little closer. It's definitely not, Fire and Blood doesn't give us the answer, but I don't know of anything in A Song of Ice and Fire or The World of Ice and Fire that shows them, cl- not clearly, but heavily suspicious of them working together. You know, this is, And it's not just heavily suspicious from us as readers. The maester writing this book suggested as well, and suggests that lots of people thought of it. They were like, lots of people's immediately thought of the faceless men when these assassinations went down the way they did. And, well, th- it's interesting to think about, well, would someone ever try to, like, get back at them? I guess not, because they're just too scary. A question is asked here, if the faceless men had done these deeds, at whose bidding had they acted? And, of course, the first line, the Iron Bank of Bravos was suspected, and that is who I would suspect as well, not only because it serves this episode so well to, to, you know, make that connection look tighter, but because they were clearly the main beneficiaries of the downfall of the Regari Bank. It wasn't just that, oh, they're number one and we're number two, and we want to go back to number one. It was a lot worse than that. As we'll see a little later, there were a lot of, we'll, we'll get into the detail of how this happened, but one of the net effects prior to the Regari Bank going down, or one of the events that happened, rather, was that a bunch of money owed to the Iron Bank was purchase that debt was sold from the iron bank to the regari bank by uh through a treaty made by uh the iron throne and so all this debt payment going to the iron bank was going to the regaris instead and one of the big results of the regari bank going down was that all that went back to the iron bank so it was a huge windfall for them and in fact they benefited more than that as well but we'll get to that later so I'm really struck uh, as well by w- the way these particular political figures function. It's different in Westeros when you're assassinating a king or a queen and then you you end up looking at their heir instead. Well, when Lysandro was murdered, he well he his title as a as the head of um Lease, one of the the head magister of Lease or whatever his official title was, first magister I believe. That's not a hereditary title. So when he was, so when he's killed, all that political power he's wielding is just gone. It doesn't pass down to his son or his brother or something like that. It just passes on to whoever gets elected next. So that political benefit they were deriving from, which you can imagine is pretty substantial, having the top guy in the country also running the bank. Imagine all the back and forth he could do, all the uh, profit opportunities that he could, you know, oversee (laughs) that no one could question him on or no one could stop him from doing well that's just gone now so that's a huge advantage they lost so once again it just points to the iron bank having uh, a huge benefit from all this but beyond these specifics in the rogari bank i want to look at some smaller examples because overall i'm i'm struck by just how often fire and blood mentions the faceless men it's like they're becoming normalized They're just extremely well-known. It's like everyone has heard of them. They're not some secret, not like an open secret, like only the nobility know about them. Mushroom says Sir Dennis Hart, who is, that's basically a nobody as far as I know. House Hart? I I can hardly recall them being mentioned before. They're definitely not a major house. Wait, wait, Aziz, can you you Hartley? I did not appreciate that one. (laughs) So this guy, this this knight, this random knight, according to Mushroom, had a rival killed in King's Landing. So did he blow a huge amount of his wealth, or is this just one of Mushroom's tall tales? Mushroom's tall tales? Hmm. Uh, or is it evidence that the faceless men, well, their pricing scheme isn't exactly what we're told? I mean... Maybe when Peter Baelish says they're absurdly expensive, maybe they're just absurdly expensive to him and to other nobles because they supposedly demand a a portion of your wealth for the job, which is how poor people can afford them. 
But on the other hand, they clearly are willing to take things other than money, right? It seems so if we believe the theory that Euron paid for the murder of Balon with a dragon's egg, right? And I am 99% sold on that theory. You got to leave room to be wrong most of the time. So 1% chance that's not true. So I definitely believe it. And if and because I believe it, that means I believe that the faceless men are willing to take wealth that isn't uh, necessarily uh, a full percentage of Euron's wealth. I mean, he he had a ton of money. He gave away at the king's moot after giving away that egg. Was that really a percentage of his wealth? Did it count the Valyrian steel armor and the dragon horn? I I don't know, man. That doesn't seem like a percentage of his wealth, at least in the, unless you want to say it's a smaller percentage. It certainly isn't like three quarters of his wealth. Which points to their ethos and everything not being a moral yeah. thing and being more of sometimes they have ambitions or they have certain goals that they want, like to get a dragon egg or take a dragon egg out of commission or whatever. Yeah. And so I think the case is pretty strong that if we're going to call them, we'll call them Chekhov's assassins, like George called Chekhov's dire wolves and Chekhov's meteor sword. <laughs> These things are all hanging over the Game of Thrones right now, ready to take out a piece or two. if We can keep the game metaphor going. But as I've been saying, that's probably not the extent of it. So what do we have here? We have a case where we suspect the faceless men are going to get involved on a political scale. But who? Who might their target be? There's maybe too many possibilities for us to go through them all. But if we're looking at the higher high ups, like the people that need to be taken out by other political players, well, that narrows things down to potentially all the claimants, right? Maybe, you know, guys like, well, not maybe not Stannis because the bank is already backing him. But Cersei, Tommen, Marcella, Danny herself, Fagon even. Maybe someone would send a faceless man after him. I'm, I'm not entirely sure why, but hey, it's possible. And plenty of other political figures, uh, maybe someone, maybe a faceless man comes for Illyrio. I, I'm not really sure why that would happen, but you know, there's it's it seems like some murders are are gonna happen at the hands of the faceless men, and it it's not just gonna be Arya. So we have uh we have that coming. Now we should consider that they don't just kill people. You know, uh, not only do they not necessarily need a contract, because again, Jack and Hagar in the in the Citadel. Is he there on a contract? Did someone pay him to go steal this book, Death of Dragons, which might be why he's there? I, let me back up a little and make sure y'all know what I'm talking about. I think that theory is, is, is out there, but I want to be sure that I'm not confusing anyone. Tyrion mentions while he's traveling down river that there's a book uh, while he's, while he's writing down all he knows about dragon lore, because John Connington commands him to write down everything he knows about dragon lore. And as he's doing that, he's thinking about this book that's in the Citadel called A Death of Dragons. That's a pretty no, uh, that's a pretty interesting title, isn't it? A Death of Dragons? We don't get a description on it, but Tyrion does say that's the only known copy in the world. And, well, that might be what Jockin Hagar is there to steal. That's the guess. And why do we know it's Jockin? Well, because the, 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 he looks, as the alchemist, he looks exactly like what Arya sees when he passes his hand over his face to lose his Lorathi look. You know, he had the red and white hair, and then he changed himself to curly black hair with a scar, and it's the exact same description. So if he's there looking up dragon lore, and if that book description is, well, if that description describes what it really is about, like how to kill a dragon, which is a reasonable theory given the, the title of the book, A Death of Dragons, I, then, th I think How to Kill a Dragon sounds like the really dark sequel to How to Train a Dragon. Like <laughs> how to really... Kill a Dragon. Yeah, if you if you can't train your dragon, if you fail to train your dragon, you need part two. <laughs> <laughs> and so that, this also shows us that if this theory is accurate, and this is another one, I, maybe I don't put 99% on this one like I do with the Dragon Egg Euron Balon thing. Maybe this is more of a 95%. Uh, then we're then we're left to believe that the faceless men are willing to kill dragons and not just people, which is interesting. Uh, it's not too strange because we know that the Bravosi culture hates dragons. They're against the Valyrians and all that. That was part of their founding was hatred of Valyria. It was it's in their it's in their blood. <laughs> and 
so that fits pretty well. But again, it doesn't necessarily lead us to the whole story. Why is it just this one guy? You know, is it is he acting on his own? Is this some sort of did the faceless men leadership meet to decide this? Who the heck is that? If so, I mean, we see Arya serving food to a bunch of different faceless people in one scene. And of course, none of them are probably revealing their real look there. And if you recall, they're discussing who can take this particular job because one of their, you know, beliefs is to you don't kill somebody you know. And well, that's a whole other thing too, not killing somebody you know. I'm not even I'm not even going to get into that today cuz uh, I don't know how that's going to play into this, but it's another piece of the puzzle that we have to keep um in mind. So apart from removing a piece from the game that, that if it could mean a dragon, uh, let's start to get into the who the people could be, you know, which people could she take out? I I threw out some names, but we can get a little more specific. Before we move on to that, um we need to consider a few other things. Uh, for example, where are they now? They're taking money for killing, right? Which originally they were killing because, you know, it was the gift of mercy. It was a very, very religious thing, um, you know, born out of extremely horrible circumstances. The suffering of the people in the minds of Valyria is just really intense. It's really awful. But they've come a long way since then. It's been four or five hundred years. I forget the exact number, but they take money to kill now, even though it's done with these sort of uh, rules, <laughs> you know, like these strictures. Still, they're taking money to kill, and we don't really know what they do with that money or where it goes or yeah, what are they not giving it to the poor as far as we know? They're not like making their temple look all have, fancy. Have you seen the house of black and white? It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. <laughs> they got a, there's a lot of maintenance on, on a, on a big temple type thing like that. <laughs> those faces, those fake faces cost a lot yeah. of money, right? <laughs> so you wonder if, you know, it's kind of the way George is with writing. You wonder if he could, what could George, a guy who believes in corruption and has a maybe a nihilistic view about humanity, maybe not a fully nihilistic, but at least a nihilistic streak in there. Would he really have an organization go for 500 years or so without becoming corrupted, without getting at least darker or without at least moving away from their original founding uh, ideals? Not necessarily completely away from them, but, you know, shifting, if not moving pretty far away. So... It's hard to say, but this is something we can build on as we move through this episode. Because if we're talking about money corrupting them, well, well, that's a good time to talk about the Iron Bank, isn't it? The Iron Bank is, of course, the biggest supplier of money in the entire world that we know of. So if, if anyone's going to corrupt you with money, well, that's a good place to start, especially because these guys are neighbors. So let's bring the bank into this, into this discussion. But first off, as we do, let's take our first set of questions that are related to... This episode from Brendan B. Love you guys. This is for your roof. Well, thank you very much. We will put that to good use. Hopefully, uh, it's not as bad as the first <laughs> estimates are, but we'll see. Thomas Pappas, hey, buddy, good to see you. Very generous super chat there. He says, because I've missed you guys and want to make sure you have enough spending cash to party with me at Con of Thrones. Well, this definitely helps. We're uh, we're really looking forward to partying at Con of Thrones, and it sure is nice to you know, not have to worry about spending money. Grumpkin R.R. Snark. Love that name. <laughs> Grumpkin R.R. Snark. That deserves a repeat. I think they want to control them as potential weapons to prevent them from hatching. Ah, of course, he's referring to the dragon eggs there. That's a cool idea. Yeah. You know, if you get the dragon eggs, assuming you see, um, uh, you know, other eggs out there. Not that we know necessarily of too many other eggs, but they're definitely out there. If they see that Daenerys hatched some eggs, they might be like, whoa, let's let's not let that happen anymore. Three dragons is enough. Um, yeah, that's an easy, interesting idea. Oh, I didn't even think about it as a possibility that they didn't realize that it would happen in the first place, that someone could hatch dragons and that that would change their, perce their perspective on it. Yeah, you wonder, like, that's why great, did they yeah. accept Euron's payment in the first place? Obviously, the egg is worth a lot, yeah. so it does have huge monetary value, yeah. but... That's extra reason for them to want it, whereas, and it explains more, well, they haven't had it, they never, I, I, I guess, 
But surely he had, like, surely he had other ways to pay, right? Yeah. He, we saw how vast wealth he had, but the egg is apparently what they wanted. Well, I'm mainly or thinking they about offer. the three dragon eggs taken by Alyssa, which I oh, guess yeah. we'll talk about later. But in terms of how that works out with their anti-dragon agenda. Yes, we're absolutely going to talk about that. So good call. Yeah, Alyssa Farman, a little bit of that's in here. Um, okay, next question is from Patrick Darty. Hey, good to see you here, buddy. The fact that the faces men don't strictly work for the small folk class shows they are very much a political actor. Hey, that's a good point. They, as we know, they apparently do work for the small folk class, but not strictly, as Patrick points out. And that is a very good point. So they serve all levels of society, but the way they serve, hmm, that's something we still have yet to be revealed. Lornaris Stormborn of House Manually. That's a cool name. Super chat. Uh, she says, my two kids are sick with the shivers today. Thank you for the escape slash entertainment first live chat. Hey, well, we're glad you could make it today. Too bad it had to be under these circumstances, but I hope your two kids get through the shivers quickly. Acre Frey asks, do you think that they thought the Targaryens having the, quote, blood of the dragon was irrelevant slash unrelated to dragons in relative modern times? Do you think it was overlooked or ignored or planned for? Yeah. I do think they would have maybe overlooked it or thought it was irrelevant because you got to figure that if they are the ones, which I do believe they're the ones who set off the chain of events that led to the destruction of Valyria. The one suggestion from the world of ice and fire was simply that there were a bunch of sorcerers holding back the 14 flames, all that force of nature being held back by sorcery and via murders. Well, that force, those forces were unleashed. The Word of Ice and Fire suggests that it was infighting between Valyrian houses, but um, I tend to lean towards the Faceless Men, especially because Arya blurts out, they killed the, they gave the gift of mercy to the slaves, they should have given it to the masters. I have two thoughts on this. And One, he says they did. Yeah. <laughs> One, regarding the Targaryens, you know, if you think, why wouldn't they have come to kill them? You know, at any point before Aegon the Conqueror was a thing or when he was actually conquering things. Yeah. So that's a question that, that merits some thought, I think, in general. But in terms of, you know, even more modern times, I think this question is very much related to what we were just talking about in terms of targeting Daenerys and not thinking certain things are possible. They might have been like... When they're comparing Valyria with all the dragons they had, they might not have thought that just like a couple dragons would be quite so dangerous. Yeah, that's true. I don't you, know. You wonder if they were aware, you know, if they were aware of her, you know, marrying Khal Drogo and just didn't care. You know, they're like, oh, this Viserys is. We don't need. We're not worried about Viserys and Daenerys. You know, no one took Daenerys seriously at first until she hatched the eggs. So, yeah, I mean, maybe they just looked at those two Targaryens and were like, meh. They're not they're not a threat. And then once the eggs hatch, they're like, whoa, well, no one saw that coming. <laughs> and yeah, now they I mean, killing her now, it's not going to stop more dragons from being born. So may, they may not want to do that. But anyway, we'll get into their the idea that they might want to kill her a little later. But yeah, it's interesting that they didn't try to take out Aegon the Conqueror or you know, Rhaenys or Visenya or, or any of that. any of the, the you know, any of Aegon and their ancestors who had dragon, yeah. there was a dragon there before. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, Game and the Glorious and all these other folks, yeah. Danys the Dreamer and all them, they just, it didn't seem to be a big issue for them. Maybe it's, uh, and, and one of the, I'm gonna throw this out now, I think it's because, or potentially it's because the, of the two, slavery and dragons, you know, the two things that they hate. I think they hate slavery a lot more than they hate dragons. Yeah, I think I would agree with that for sure. It's just that dragons can make it very easy to enslave someone. That's but very if true. Ethos, like, for example, with Daenerys. She's then, clearly not doing yeah, that. <laughs> she's clearly very anti-slavery. Yeah. So that might say that for now, that might be saving her. That might be why they haven't come for her. Or maybe they'll just come for her later. Maybe they're waiting for her to be more in a spot where they can get her. Danny's going to be gifted a, a fourth dragon egg by Bravo. So they're like, come on. <laughs> Hatch this one too. Now maybe they're just going to kill her after she frees all the slaves. Like, well, let her take out all the slaves trade first and then we'll, you know, mm -hmm. then it's just, as soon as she starts using those dragons on non-slave nations, then uh, then we'll change it. But a little more about the early Targaryens though. They, they brought their slaves with them to Westeros at first. I guess at some point they had to stop with that because it wasn't allowed in Westeros. But it's said specifically that Aenar Targaryen brought his dragons, his household, his slaves. Specifically that word is used. But hey, 
you know, I guess that was maybe that's just part of them adapting to Westeros. But yeah, I wonder. I mean, I wonder. If Aegon still had slaves at a certain point, and I'm guessing uh, yeah. he didn't. But yeah, maybe Aenar did. Maybe yeah. You know. And somewhere in between, maybe it ended, and maybe that would have been something to attract the attention of the Phaedrus men if they didn't stop that. Then again, you don't exactly see, uh, or at least we don't hear about, we don't hear about wise masters dropping left and right, right? No, I guess not. Or, I mean, even the Ironborn, they effectively do have slaves. Yeah. On the other hand, these are assassins. Killing, there's no particular Ironborn or Giscard you could kill to stop the slave trade. Yeah, that's a good point. You know what I mean? If there's one particularly powerful slave leader killing that guy, that matters. But yeah, you're not going to change the culture of the Ironborn with a few murders, nor will you do the same to Slaver's Bay. So that I guess that that holds up, I think. Yeah. Another, another super chat from Michael Pearson, in all caps, for the roof. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Much appreciated. Hopefully we don't have to take a loan from the Iron Bank. We know how they are. But here we get into the money side of things. Now, the money, of course, is... Well, that's where you get into the lifeblood slash the death blood. <laughs> you know, money is, is so often the reason people fight, so often the reason people backstab each other, so often the reason that people are corrupted, so often the, the thing that people need to survive. So it's really, you know, it's uh, money. You know, you can't live with it, can't live without it, right? <laughs> and of course, money lending comes up a lot in general, but it really comes up in Fire and Blood. It's the thing that I noticed that pops up a lot. They're just throughout the different eras we see in Fire and Blood, whether it's, well, not at the beginning. Aegon the Conqueror didn't take out any loans as far as we know, but not long after there were loans being taken. Um, it looks like Magor took out loans because Jaehaerys was dealing with his debt or the crown's debt. And maybe Aegon did take out loans, we just didn't see it. This just isn't suggested. That debt came from somewhere, Jaehaerys was handling it. Maybe it was all his debt, but I'm guessing it was Magor the Cruel with all those building projects. But it could have been Aegon because he had building projects too. However, he also got all this money from conquering. Whereas, you know, years later, they don't have that, you know, initial loot or whatever. Uh, so that's a little different. Now, this is where we need to tie things into what's actually happening in A Song of Ice and Fire right now to make sure we have our ducks in a row, or our Starks in a row, as it were. John deals with Tycho Nestoris. Not only does Tycho Nestoris make his deal with Stannis, but he heads north to the Wall and doing a deal with John. That's interesting to me because, you know, you wonder how the watch is going to pay them back. And uh, I guess the Iron Bank isn't too worried about the, the others coming. <laughs> I guess, you know, like most people, they don't know the others are a real threat and they see that huge wall and think, ah, y'all are safe. What could possibly <laughs> worry you guys with that wall? Yeah, and even though, I mean, if you even look at, up at the map, if you're watching on YouTube, at where Bravos is, it, it's pretty far north, you yeah, know? It, mm -hmm. Like, it's pretty far north, um, so it will get cold there, but there's also just a big, like, a, a pretty decent-sized sea between them. Yeah. So they're, they're very unconcerned. Yeah, they're very unconcerned about that uh, in the short term. I wonder if they'll find reasons to be concerned <laughs> given how things go. We see dead things in the water. I don't know if they can swim all the way to Bravos, and I kind of doubt they can freeze the whole ocean. I think the myths of the Long Nights would have mentioned that because it's such an astonishing thing. I... I feel like and I don't I sometimes there's theories about it but some people have theorized about there being some sort of you know emigration of people to Essos to try to escape and stuff like that mm. and oftentimes they they think of it in this grand sense like a lot of people will move but on a smaller scale I you know if people have access to ships just leave just go to Essos like it's really hard to do yeah. in a certain level but some of the more noble people <laughs> Take ship from, like, White Harbor straight yeah, to... Just, it's just close, yeah. just straight go over, and you'd be, like, you know, much safer and warmer. I don't know. I feel like it would be a very good strategy. It might be. Yeah, we might see that happen. I'm, I'm curious about that. You know, there's, there's a lot... Of, I mean, Bravos is definitely the city we've seen the... I mean, by far, the city we've seen the most of outside of Westeros, right? We've seen, you know... Bits and pieces of marine. We've I seen... mean, we have a Bravos map in the Lands of Ice and Fire, and we have a King's Landing map. Those are the two cities <laughs> that we've had a map for. So yeah. yes, <laughs> definitively. <laughs> we have Arya there all that time. She's still there in the books. Obviously, uh, you know, it's a little different in the show, but you know, we're not going to talk about that. Sam goes there in the books, and Gilly, and of course, Maester Aemon dies there, and uh, you know. It's uh, it's an important spot. It's and I feel like it's going to get more important. And as we move forward in this episode. You'll, you're just continuing to see why, because uh, once we get to the Sea Lord, you're going to see how politically involved they are. Right now, we're just talking about the assassins and the money, and we haven't even gotten into the politics and war yet, but we will. 
So let's talk about um, the fallout from Alyssa Farman here with the Iron Bank. It's kind of funny. First of all, a little a little aside story here. Basically, what Alyssa did was she forced the uh, the crown to cash in a dr- three dragon eggs, right? Because they didn't get the eggs back, but the but the Bravosi Sea Lord paid for them, right? Now we're going to talk about that scene specifically a bit later. But the idea is that the uh, once they did that, what I want to point to is a different aspect now, which is once they did that, it cleared out all their debt to the Iron Throne. And what they did with that money is pretty cool. They used it to build sanitation. They built sanitation. They built uh, cleaner water for King's Landing. And uh, that's a really cool thing, right? So Alyssa Farman stole three dragon eggs, and it led to sanitation in King's Landing. Hmm. Well, that's a pretty indirect result, isn't it? And it's funny how the Sea Lord paid for them twice, right? He paid Alyssa Farman for them and then paid to not give them back to Jerry and Septon Barth. So that's how badly they wanted them, I think. It kind of points to that, to Right, and why did they want them so badly? Is it he's just really that into fancy stuff? Does yeah. he really have that much money? Maybe. It I might mean, be that, but I don't know. But how, he didn't, it doesn't even seem like he had them for, um, I guess he had them for a good, they had, Bravo's had it for a decent amount of time. Yeah, it, it, that's if they're Danny's eggs. If they're not, then they might still have them. Yeah, which that's is crazy true. to think about. But there's another. Here's another thing to think about. I know some of y'all probably noticed that the dragon eggs may have their value may have changed over time. Not not these eggs, but I mean, if you consider what Illyrio that Illyrio gave eggs to Daenerys, and then you consider how much they're worth in this light, it's like, did he really give something that valuable to this princess who he was using as a smokescreen? I actually can believe it. First of all, Lirio got super rich from arrange, or he was already super rich. He got even richer for arranging Daenerys and Khal Drogo's marriage. Second of all, he really, remember what their plan is? They want Khal Drogo to invade Westeros. So they got to really, you know, bribe the dude. And you're saying, wait, the eggs we gave were given to Danny. <laughs> nah, y'all. This is the Dothraki. Whatever Danny has belongs to Drogo. Those eggs were in her possession, but if Drogo wanted them, they're his. Which no al- question. Which also explains why you mean you'd think that they would be a huge temptation to anyone if you just ran off with that egg, but you would be, you know, treating Paul <laughs> yeah, the tra- Thraki coming after yeah, you. Yeah, you cannot do that. So they <laughs> are very safe there. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. And and furthermore, this is what I meant by the market value of the eggs. It seems to me that the market value of dragon eggs has dropped since the incident of Alyssa Farman. During her time, Dragon eggs could hatch. They did so, maybe not regularly, but often enough, right? By the time Illyrio gives these eggs to Daenerys, no dragon is hatched in 150 years. So there's no implied, maybe this will hatch and I'll have a dragon idea. Well, as it turned out, that's funny. He held on to the eggs all this time. None of them ever hatched until he gave them away. <laughs> but of course, there's no way he could have known that. So it actually does, it's pretty interesting. The idea that these eggs maybe had more value when there was a, some thought that they could hatch. I mean, Jaharis was worried they'd hatch. That was part of the whole problem here. If they were just colored stones, if they really were what the Sea Lord was trying to call them, just fancy stones, just colored jeweled items, you know, a prize, then Jaharis and Barth wouldn't have cared. They'd be like, yeah, we don't care, keep them. You know, it sucks that she stole that, but it's not a threat to the throne. That's the reason they cared. You know, I, I hadn't considered this before, but the idea that these dragons were taken before the death of dragons, and, and if Daenerys yeah. woke them, uh, were they less dead? Yeah. I doubt it, but like I just had never really considered when they were taken. Yeah, when were, yeah, and when and how long has the death of dragons been in the Citadel? Like Tyrion's aware of it. Has he seen it personally? He just heard about it because he's a scholar and he's up to date on the cool yeah. books and where they are. Yeah, I don't know. So yeah, like maybe all the eggs after that point were like poisoned in some way, basically, you know, malformed and there was a difficulty with that. But yeah. that other, I don't know, the eggs that were, I don't know. It's just an interesting thought I hadn't had before, I guess. Yeah. So backing up just a little bit after the this deal with Septon Barth, when they agree to not give back the eggs, but to instead, you know, forgive this debt, this huge debt to the Iron Throne or to the Iron Bank. They, like I said, immediately start spending that money again and rack up new debt because they're paying for uh, all these other projects, these public works projects plus other things. And 
War, of course, creates the need for even more projects, which is interesting because we're trying to, as obviously one of our goals here in this episode is to think about how the Iron Bank and the Faceless Men and the Sea Lord could get involved in the latter stages of A Song of Ice and Fire. Some of these are pretty straightforward, but here's one that's maybe not so straightforward. Think about all the destruction that's going to happen in King's Landing, assuming Fagon takes it, even if Cersei, you know, flees uh, and just finds the throne empty, uh, or Fagon finds the throne empty, there's going to be war. There's going to be fighting in the the kingdom and if not in king's landing itself and that could re- that could mean a lot of destruction that could mean the need to rebuild things let alone the fact that we've seen people borrow money to feed the their uh people who need to be fed <laughs> feed themselves john of course does this and fire and blood tells us that cregan stark did the same thing. He borrowed money from the Iron Bank to feed the North when the really horrible winter was coming on during the Dance for the Dragon. So pretty bad time to have uh, winter coming on so heavily, uh, meaning during war. Uh, it's already hard enough to feed an army with uh, all that happening as well. So here's where we need to, you know, start naming some names, right? Right now they're backing Stannis. Okay, so let's assume that Stannis dies at some point. Let's assume Stannis doesn't end up on the Iron Throne at the end of the books. At some point he dies, then the Iron Bank is going to have to back someone else. I don't think they're just going to be taken out of the game. No one's going to go to Bravos and just torch the Iron Bank entirely. Well, I guess that's possible. I don't think that's going to happen. Let's, let's leave a 1% on that one, too. 1% chance for the 1%. <laughs> and... Uh, maybe they back Fagon, you know, he's, especially if he's doing well, he's like, oh, this, this guy's doing well. Let's back the eventual winner because he looks like he's going to win. Uh, and I would guess they back Fagon over Danny. Probably though, that I don't feel super confident with like, uh, because they, their, their goal again is to make sure they get their debts. And if Danny's freeing slaves, the timing can really matter here. They can't, they can't necessarily back both at the same time or can they hmm, actually, they can back both at the same time. Modern banks have done that all the time. Yeah, Banks do that in war. Banks back, you know, arms dealers sell to both sides in war. This is not uncommon at all. The Iron Bank surely has done this in the past, but maybe not as often as other banks do because the Iron Bank wants to, you know, they're, they're, they're interested in, in the long term of, of a regime and keeping uh, and being the, the bank, the kind of the official bank of, of that regime. And, uh, you know, playing both sides can only go so far because, well, you don't want to have, you know, you don't want to have the bad will of the eventual winner saying, hey, you supported the other side. <laughs> I, I'm reminded of Always Sunny in Philadelphia in their kind of vaguely Game of Thrones episode where he's like, I'm, I'm supporting both sides. I'm playing both sides. <laughs> it's like, why are you telling? You're not supposed to tell anyone you're playing both sides. It's like, oh, but I'm a. I'm a triple agent. You don't tell people you're a triple agent. <laughs> but obviously, like the Iron Bank is doing that. You know when they've supported someone because they've sent them a lot of money. Yeah, they're not they're not subtle about it. They're just like <laughs> it's almost like they expect that to add to the whole picture. They're like they almost you expect know? to say, "Uh oh, we're ba- the Iron Bank yeah. is backing that claimant." That almost like scares off the other claimants. You wonder you know how much of an effect that has. What it also makes me think of is political campaigns. There are tons of people who support multiple sides and oh, yeah. like, all that for political <laughs> campaigns is very common. Almost every big corporation sends donations to like every like important politician. They're like 5,000 here, 5,000 here. What's yeah. the maximum we can send to this guy? Okay, send him that. <laughs> yeah, they're all, you're right. It's just, it's basically just a lot of bribery. And that's what these banks do too. Uh, but the Iron Bank is a little different, you know, because they're they're a little more aggressive. They're a little bit more about picking one side than it is uh, playing all the sides. But I'm sure they have different ways of doing things. They do whatever makes them money, you know? Another person to think about is Euron and all this. It's, I kind of doubt there's any chance the Iron Bank would back Euron. But how would they treat him in general? They can't just be, like, backing everyone else and being like, stop Euron, but... I wonder about the Euron Cersei thing. Yeah, you know, yeah. Like, I don't know. I do too. Yeah, if Euron and Cersei are gonna hook up, which is partially, or at least it's suggested by the the dream in um, the Forsaken, and again to throw out why some people are wondering why would Euron and Cersei hook up? Well, from Cersei's point of view, it's because she's losing and needs someone else to hook up with to help her get back in the game. From Euron's point of view, well, maybe he likes the idea of a Lannister bride, but he definitely likes the idea of a baby with Lannister blood in it because of the magical aspect there right 
uh, King's Blood, right? I think that is a compelling reason for Euron to maybe want to do that. Uh, I so, think it also gives him some more legitimacy and yeah. land to claim, and I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly... Like, why not? If he, if, yeah, I feel like he would just want all the powerful women he could, he could have. Yeah, I mean, why not? Yeah, like, he, he he's after power. Of course, he's after it in, in non-traditional ways, but he's also just thinking about the Iron Bank and Euron. Euron is a guy that we've seen. He doesn't personally care about wealth, but he absolutely cares about what wealth can do in terms of getting him power. He doesn't care about holding on to it, but he loves its ability to, as a bribing tool and as a, a way to corrupt people. He likes that. And so you could see how he would make use of large sums, uh, although it's kind of hard to see how he would arrange it. But he is charismatic. You know, he can he can be not crazy if he wants to be. He can be, you know, he can be a, a charming, charismatic, non-crazy, oh, oh, well, to be fair, sort of non-crazy the seeming Iron guy. The Bank and the Faceless Men have to have many eyes that can tell them what That's kind true. of a person your on Greyjoy is. I don't yeah. think he's going to gonna hide his craziness to them. That's fair. As long as they think he's intelligent and if he's going to pay. You know, like, if he's a little crazy, that's fine. If he's smart and, and going to pay them back, then that's that's all they care about. So, it's very interesting to consider what, an, what a dark alliance that would be. Euron backed by the Iron Bank. It doesn't necessarily seem like the kind of thing that could happen, but I also don't see why it wouldn't. You know, it, maybe it's not super likely, but there's no nothing, there's no reason that, would, that, that I can point to that says that definitely won't happen. You know? Uh, especially if he, you know, wants to can kind of bring them into the game against against Danny, or can kind of convince them that they need to do that. Or if we look at this the other direction, you know, the faceless man and the Iron Bank having some kind of relationship. Well, if Euron has already contracted the faceless man and they have a tighter relationship than we think, then they're already potentially aware of him. He's already been to Bravos. He may have already dealt with them. So, and another possibility: Jon Snow. What if they find out about Jon Snow being the real heir? What do they do then? Do they be like, uh, well, is this kid gonna make a play? Is he going to try to be king? He might not. But if they think he is, then they have to consider that. So there's a lot of possibilities here. And the way the Iron Bank handles claims, well, it's something, it's been said early on in A Song of Ice and Fire that when the Iron Bank, when they back a claimant, rivals tend to be toppled. Not necessarily assassinated, right? Although sometimes they clearly are. But usually it's just that, the, that they fund their rivals um, you know, like I said, you can't just, just sometimes an assassination isn't going to get the job done. Sometimes you need an army, right? Uh, and, but they didn't get so powerful and feared by being overly scrupulous, right? They didn't, they don't just fund armies and sit back and say, this is the ethical way to do it. You know, armies versus armies, a touch of test of strength. Surely not. Surely they just do whatever's most efficient money wise, uh, whatever reaches their goals, ethics be damned. You know, I don't, I'm sure they don't want to look like they're betraying the, uh, the value, the Bravosi cultural values by, you know, supporting slavery. I doubt they do that. But I wouldn't be surprised if they did indirectly. You know, like, imagine, think of the portfolio, like the stock portfolios of a super, super rich guy. You know, these businesses are all dealing with each other. At what point is your money invested in, in an evil business if that biz, if, if, you know, if it's dealing with other businesses that deal with them? You know, I hope that made sense. <laughs> you know, it's like... The faceless men are killers and they work with the Iron Bank and the Iron Bank works with these other businesses and they work with, you know, how it's a matter of getting at these connections and how tight they are. And that's what we talked about at the beginning. You know, if the but, Iron Bank uses the faceless men often enough, do they get like a, a punch card? You know, yeah, yeah. your fifth assassination is free. <laughs> so, and this is all, this is just like the bare minimum though, right? The connection could be really deep. They could, for all we know that the, Key holders of the Iron Bank, that's what they're called, could have regular meetings with whoever runs the Faceless Man. That's another thing that we just, we don't even know who their leaders are. We just know that, I mean, are they run democratically? Is it just like a loose collective of people with very strict beliefs that they can kind of count on everyone holding, uh, upholding? Or do they occasionally have some self-policing? Do they occasionally have to kill each other? Or, and how could they do that if they're not supposed to kill people they know? That can, creates quite a conundrum, doesn't it? How can a faceless man ever kill another faceless man if they're not allowed to kill someone they know? Do they are they compartmentalized? So they sometimes don't know each other. Do they not know they don't know each other because they wear so many disguises? Well, this is quite a rabbit hole, isn't it? And let's see here. This was some of this was shown to us via Fire and Blood outside of the Game of Thrones, meaning 
The story we got was not a story over rival claimants to a throne or city-state or the equivalent, but supremacy over the banking world, right? The example that uh, we talked about earlier with the Rogari Bank. When they started outperforming the Iron Bank, people started moving money from the most famous bank in Bravos to this powerful upstart in Lease. And when Prince Viserys was ransomed back to Oakenfist in secret, remember Oakenfist discovered that Prince Viserys was being held all this time? He went and arranged to have him released. Part of the deal was what I referred to here. This is where that came in. Iron Throne transfers their debt from the Iron Bank to the Regari Bank, and all of a sudden, whoa. So it's not a Game of Thrones. It's it's a game of loans. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't, you know, that was too obvious, but I just, I couldn't let that one slip by. I had to make that pun. <laughs> And this isn't resolved by market competition. That's often how, you know, modern banks, you know, they, they deal with things. They have to, you know, kind of win in the marketplace by making better decisions. And, you know, there's some, there's some, you know, corruption going on in the background. But it's most of what they have to do is on the up and up. But the Rogari Bank was hit with what looked like coordinated assassinations and a whispering campaign. Meaning, the, uh, there's, we're told that the Iron Bank started spreading rumors that the Rogari Bank was insolvent. Now that is a big deal. If you're a rich investor and you've got your money stashed at the Iron Bank or at the uh, Rogari Bank and you hear rumors that they don't really have the money to cover your deposit, in other words, they've spent your money, that's terrifying, right? If, you're, if you rely on your wealth like that. And that's a really good way to doom a bank because everyone starts pulling their money out and all of a sudden they can't cover the deposits or they can't, you know, do the things they need to do with that money that do the things that bankers do, you know, make profit off of uh, the, the money that they're holding on to with investments and ventures and things like that. Well, if they don't have any money, they can't do that. And the bank just collapses. And of course, in this case, the Royal Gary Bank probably really was insolvent or at least partially insolvent. So these rumors were, were founded, at least maybe they were exaggerated, but they were at least somewhat founded. Um, so it's possible that they were lying just to make it worse but in any case you see how this works it's similar to the game of thrones but you know and money big money is involved and people are being murdered but the big one of the big differences is there's no armies i guess <laughs> and some other things too but there's a lot of stark similarities another interesting thing here the iron bank had disputes with tyland lannister when he was hand and i was wondering if perhaps uh he was course hand after the dance of the dragons he's the one that had the, the horrible mutilations done with him the hooded hand he's called i was wondering maybe he was assassinated um he because he had these disputes with the iron bank his death was said to be winter fever and although he died really quickly much faster than most people die from winter fever about twice as fast so i looked around to see if there's any known poisons that would have similar symptoms to winter fever that would be a pretty clever way to make it look like he died of the same fever if, if there's a poison that has similar symptoms and the reason I looked is because he died faster, so I thought maybe that was uh, a clue. But unfortunately, most of the poisons, and there are a lot of them, most of them don't have their symptoms listed. We just know the name. So whether or not this was a substitute poison for the winter fever, I don't know. That trail went cold. <laughs> <sighs> I'm dropping all of, I'm dropping too many puns here, guys. <laughs> But most of the cases where the Iron Bank gets involved more directly in the Game of Thrones are centered around armies, not assassins. But as we've shown here, there's assassins are part of their, you know, arsenal of options for dealing with rivals and claimants and, and business competitors. See, assassins can remove rival claimants, but you can't just give someone a throne directly, right? You still have to take a throne um, you know, from the other people who are there. Unless, I mean, there's, there's always some exceptions to that. But generally speaking, uh, an assassination is uh, often not going to be enough. On the other hand, if an assassination is successful, or like the, as we saw with the uh, Rogari, the two Rogari brothers dying so close together, if it's not so epic and spectacular like that, when it looks more like an accident at a time that isn't suspicious. In other words, the records might not show it, right? The records might not show a natural death that looked like a natural death if it was actually an assassination. They wouldn't ever be suspicious, right? That's why I was maybe reaching here with Tylen Lannister because I was trying to find examples of at least the, the concept of a, of a death that might have been a murder that isn't suggested as such because surely that happens. Now, let's move on here. 
Let's recap what we know about the current situation in A Song of Ice and Fire, armed with our new knowledge of how the Iron Bank has been involved in the past, uh, meaning in what we've been told in Fire and Blood, as well as what we already knew before Fire and Blood. But first, let's take care of our mid-roll. It is about halfway through the episode, so that is time to do that. Big shout out to our Blood Rider patrons. They make the show possible along with the other patrons and they deserve credit for their contributions. Vorsaki is wielder of a Valerian steel arak with a dragon bone hilt. Cole Coey is called Sun Piercer, wielder of a dragon bone bow. And Kukavo the Tamer is wielder of the wildfire whip Gehenna. Also want to give shout outs to our northern champions. I think it's been a minute since they got their shout out. J. Wilson Winters King, Sir Stephen Hammer of the North, Winters King Lord of the First Men, Lady Air Erdross, Mother of Wolves, Wielder of the Valyrian Steel Claymore Manticore. Sir Brian the Return, Knight of the Last House, Wielder of the Valyrian Steel Blade Red Song. Sir Kobe of House Stonesmith, Words are Wind, ha, uh, Deeds are Stone. Lady Cat Jones of the Big Pond is Wielder of the Valyrian Steel Blade Ginger's Honor. Jake Snow, a.k.a. Jacob Ice Eyes, is the Bastard of the Last River. Lord Darren of House Ramblers, motto is The Last Hunt is Ceaseless. Lady Bobby is of House Mitchell. Bullweir the Purple of Heavenly Mythhead House Taurus is second but not uh, is our second to last listed here. And finally, last but not least, Gandalf the White is Lord of House Seamorn. Also, a shout out to one of our sponsors, Shire Post Mint. They have Faceless Man coins along with lots of other cool coins. I mentioned the Faceless Man coin because I think it's the first one we ever got. It looks exactly like the coin uh, or this logo on my shirt, uh, which is not related to... to, to um, uh, the Shire Post Mint is just a cool shirt, but it, this is the exact hooded figure that you see on their coins. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, they've got a lot of different options there. They've got like iron or silver, like a necklace version of the Faceless Man coin, and a Bravosi Iron Square with Iron Bank written on it and Bravos and yeah. Bravos written. It's pretty cool, so, huh? So yeah, they're really awesome. They're a really good product, yeah. And you can get 15% off by using the code history at ShirePostMint.com. Also, I want to mention that it's a good time to review your uh, audio situation with, uh, with regards to audiobooks. If you have not tried out an Audible trial, well, it's a decent time to try now. You can get two free downloads for the cost of, well, the cost of nothing. You sign up for the subscription, and if you don't want to keep it, well, drop it and keep those two free downloads for no charge. If you do keep it, well, you get more free downloads with your subscription as it uh, goes forward. And, of course, I could suggest you get our book, uh, which is called uh, <laughs> The Thrones Effect. Totally spaced out on that. That we contributed with a bunch of other YouTubers, too. Also, you could get Fire and Blood. Or if you're doing Valar Reread Us with us, grab a Game of Thrones. Or if you've already got your Game of Thrones, grab a Clash of Kings. Maybe reading is taking too much time out of your day, what, and you want to try wait, to combine it with your chores. What if they've got a Clash of Kings? Should they get a Storm of Swords? Oh, whoa. I, I hadn't thought that far ahead. And what if they, if they already have a Storm of Swords, a Feast for Crows? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> get a Feast for Crows. What about after have... that? Oh, I don't know. What's the, what's the fifth know, book? I forget know, the name. No. Send <laughs> us an email and let us know, please. Yeah, if you know what to do, we have no idea. <laughs> So those are, that's our, um, and of course, uh, one last shout out for our Queens of Love and Beauty. Almost accidentally skipped y'all. That would be a shame. Y'all have some of the coolest shout outs we have. From the depths of Flea Bottom, Lord Ken of House Hammer has declared for Queen Carey, Fire of the North, who recovered Dark Sister from beyond the wall. And a laurel of glory in the name of love to Bud of House Beresford, a knight of Tolkien and, Ar uh, and Arbiter of Scotch. From Sandy the Dragon, Blood of Queen Daenerys, and Lady of Jameson. Cool, cool. All right. So, yeah, let's talk about who uh, the, the Iron Bank will can slash back or kill and review a bit of what's happening right now uh, as things stand in A Song of Ice and Fire to make sure we know where we're at. Okay, so, of course, we talked about Stannis has Tycho Nostoris backing him. He sent Justin Massey to go get cell swords. He wants the Golden Company, but as we know, he's not going to get them because they're already in Westeros backing a claimant he doesn't even know exists. So Stannis has a few surprises in store. But I believe he also has a few uh, surprises planned for the Boltons as well. Hmm. However, that's off topic. So, so Stannis has wealth now, all of a sudden, just out of nowhere. He didn't have hardly any money. Now he has a lot of money. It's, it's all of a sudden made him a major player again. If you thought he wasn't, he is. If you thought he was before getting the money, then you must think he's a huge player again. Either way, it's a huge windfall for him. Even Stannis 
understands that bribes have to be given. He doesn't think of them as bribes. Maybe he does, but he doesn't call them that. But he realizes that a king must be open-handed. You saw him giving the castles of the Night's Watch away, even to people who were terrible. Like, he wanted to give one to Rattleshirt, of all people. He was thinking of giving one to the Weeper. I mean, so if he's going to do that, he, he'll bribe some awful people, too, if he has to. He's willing to do it. He doesn't like it. Let's put it that way. This means, too, that we have to consider what else the Iron Bank is doing. Because they're backing Stannis, that might mean that they're going to target Stannis' foes. Mm, right? Right? Yeah. So, who? Right? Uh, and so far, this hasn't happened in the Song of Ice and Fire because Tycho Nostoris is pretty late in the game, right? He's near the end of Dance of Dragons, or at least halfway point. So, a lot of targets if they're going to get into the assassination game. Again, we bring up Daenerys, Young Griff, Tommen, Cersei, Euron... Leaders of major factions, you know, anyone supporting someone other than Stannis, maybe a general, some, you know, something like that. Now, some of these have nothing to do with the Iron Bank, but are clearly important overall, right? And hey, maybe the Iron Bank will be involved in some of these after all. For example, Kevin Lannister's removal put Cersei back in play, and that had an immediate effect on uh, the Iron Bank. We're not going to go into all the possibilities of who the Iron Bank might want removed, but I will throw out a couple more names just to, just for consideration purposes, just to hey, let your head spin a little bit. Maybe uh, you, you can think about it later. Maybe you have an idea. Send, us, send it to us uh, if you have some cool thoughts on this one. Like, for example, what happens if and when Doran Martell is assassinated? I'm not even saying it would be the Faceless Men if it even happens, but just the net effect of what's the fallout of Doran Martell dying. Same with Robin Aaron, who is probably going to be killed by Sweet Sleep, so he's going to be killed sort of assassin style. Uh, or what about Mace Tyrell? What if Mace Tyrell is killed? There's just a lot of, I mean, that would make Willis Lord of Highgarden. I don't know that that would change the Tyrell's political attitudes fundamentally, but it might. Anytime you have a house taken over by somebody else, if that somebody else is a very different person, that house's fortunes and fates and attitudes and alliances could go in an entirely different direction. I don't think the Faceless Men are just going to go around, you know, killing a lot of different heads of houses. But given we can't narrow it down a whole lot, we kind of have to throw a wide net for now, just with the caveat that we don't expect them to just go around killing a lot of people. But a few? Yeah, I think so. So Danny, let's talk about Danny for a minute, because she's such a conundrum for the Faceless Men. We've been talking about her off and on, but let's, let's really focus on her for a minute. They have this religious reason to love her position on slavery and hate her mothering of dragons. This is where politics comes into it a little bit. You know, the Iron Bank can be sneaky. They can back things without people knowing about it, potentially. They can, you know, assassinations can be, uh, you know, under the radar. But the Sea Lord, that's a little different, right? The Sea Lord, of, of, you know, the, the top political figure in Bravos, is he really going to go support someone that's so very much against their cultural values? Yeah, why not? We've seen it already, actually, in Fire and Blood. It's seen it quite a lot. The Iron Bank loaned money to the Targaryens plenty of times. The Sea Lord was usually friendly, almost always friendly, and tried very hard to avoid conflict with the Iron Throne, for the most part. And when the conflict did happen, they did what they could to make sure it didn't escalate. So, like we said earlier, and Ashea agreed, the slavery part probably matters more for the Bravosi, and that could explain, at least for now, why they don't seem to care about what Danny's doing. Maybe they will. Eventually, I think that is going to come to a head. But we've seen that the Bravosi also have forced other cities to stop their slavery, despite the money in it. Uh, in other words, the Iron Bank, as corrupt as they are, as, as money hungry as they are, they if they're involved in the slave trade, it's, it's under layers of, you know, accounting fraud or, you know, book working, you know, whatever <laughs> ways of keeping it. However they keep it hidden, they're doing that if they're doing it. So that can't, that's the kind of thing they can't do out in the open. But yeah, the, the fact that the Fire and Blood gives us lots of examples of Bravos just wanting to have trade deals and lend money and just generally be friendly with the Iron Throne when there were Targaryens riding dragons says a lot. But if the Targaryens had tried to, you know, bring slavery to Westeros, eh, yeah, I think that would have broken the deal. That would be a deal breaker. But apparently you, the dragons weren't. It's a good reason for them to want to have such a close relationship with them is that there's no way the Targaryens could ever turn on Bravos, And Bravos would have such like a hold on them that if they were ever like, 
maybe we'll make slavery legal. Probably would be like, no, we will pull <laughs> funding. Yeah, because if you were to go, if you want, like, it's one way. It's like, oh, I don't want to pay these guys. If we kill the bank, then we don't have to pay them back. Well, then they lose the faceless men on you, and you just so you just you just don't. You can't really like, eh, let's just pay them. Let's just pay <laughs> them. <laughs> you don't want to have to worry about every single person being, you know, an assassin in disguise. <laughs> so, young Griff. Let's talk about young Griff because Daenerys is supposed to slay the lie. Right, but does that mean the actual person? It's it, you might say, hey, Jesus, isn't that kind of a stretch to think that she would just reveal who he is and not kill him? And and how could Daenerys dethrone him and have him still be alive? That doesn't really seem credible, does it? I might not think so either, except for the example of Gaiman Palehair. Gaiman Palehair was foisted on the people of the time of the Dance of Dragons as a Targaryen blooded claimant, and that turned out to be a lie. Uh, you see where I'm going with this parallel? He was forced aside after the lie was revealed, but he wasn't punished because he wasn't the liar. He was just a kid. And the same thing is true of young Griff. He's not in on the lie, right? So Gaiman uh, to take this a little farther, Gaiman became friends with Aegon the Third. He became his food taster. So not only was he not killed, but he was allowed to live close with the king. Is it possible that Daenerys will not kill young Griff and will have him as an ally? I guess so. I guess we have to consider that because this story about Gaiman Palehair, well, it's it's probably means something. But let's consider that it's not pointing to this. You know, I'm not going to... The way I do things, as you guys know, is I, I don't push a theory with generally without at least trying to suggest I mean, the alternative or at least the flaws with this theory. One, My big question is how would he actually be proven to be false? That's a great one. Like, well, I, it would other be... Other than someone, uh, you know... Uh, admitting uh, to admitting it. Admitting to it. Right. Mari, Salerio, anyone else that actually... I don't know that there are really anyone else that... Yeah. knows for sure that and that would have to be it it would have to be someone admitting it and yeah. maybe that's because they've been tortured or something like that yeah. and if, like if if Varus is you know on being tortured and his the jig is up at this point like he's not going to be you know master whispers for the new regime he's done what purpose does the secret have at that point yeah i mean especially if maybe if i mean maybe he really wants his king to be in charge, but if it's if it's already yeah. too late, then yeah, he might do it. Just like maybe it'll save him if I say yeah. if I confess and say he had no idea. Yeah, something like so that. It's possible. You know, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's hard. Maybe it's hard to imagine how we get there, but that's George's best. Yeah. <laughs> George can surprise us with how he connects these dots. The point is that there is a parallel here. There is a the end of a big conflict, Dance of the Dragons, results in a Targaryen claimant who reminds us of Bran and Jon Snow who marries Daenerys. Remember that that's who Aegon the Third marries. <laughs> and then we have this game in pale hair. It's Aemon with a G in front, and he has white blonde hair like... Actually, white blonde hair is like Tommen. Mm -hmm. And Tommen is also a bastard who's not really a claimant for the throne. So maybe Gaiman is more like Tommen than Fagon, or maybe he's like so many characters, not a one-to-one -one relationship. Remember, guys... These parallel live situations are never one-to-one. -one. There's always other parallels that fit almost as well or even better sometimes. So Tommen's a pretty good parallel for Game and Pale Hair, a lot in common, but so is potentially Fagon. You know, the age thing is closer to Tommen. The hair color matches Tommen, but the whole, you know. But and so what happened to Gaiman? He was poisoned, right? He was a food taster. So that's part of why we're this this wraps us all up in this whole assassination thing. Now, it was probably Unwin Peak that poisoned Gaiman, uh, because he was also potentially targeting Denera, who Unwin wanted his his daughter to marry Aegon the Third instead. It's pretty well known at the time that Aegon the Third wasn't into eating dessert. So the idea that he was a target is already kind of unlikely. So it was probably his wife. And well. If Daenerys was a target of assassination, yeah, maybe we should consider that Daenerys will be. And it's almost like, how could she not be a target of assassination, right? There's like so many people that she's made enemies of. You know, she's busting up all these slave cities. I feel like uh, she hasn't seen the last of that. And it's already happened, right? Now, it wasn't the Faceless Men, but someone tried to poison Danny with those locusts and it almost killed Strong Bellus instead. So uh, do we really think that's the last time that's going to happen? Speaking of, Strong Bellwuss is going to get some revenge, isn't he? I hope so. You do not poison my man, Strong Bellwuss. 
Uh, Girls Gone Canon would agree that Strong Bellwas is coming for someone. But for who? We don't know who the poisoner is just yet. By the way, by the way, this is a great time for me to mention. I didn't grab this art just because it really isn't very relevant at all to places men. But Draft Urgy, who's done some art for us, does have a Strong Bellwas print in oh. his uh, store. Cool. Yeah. So check, check out Draft Urgy's store. It's yeah. a good reason to shout him out there. Yeah. Cool. Um, so another aspect about Gaiman that, uh, maybe uh, versus Fagon, well, Gaiman was five years old, forcing him aside, pff, simple, what's he going to do, stand up and fight? <laughs> Fagon's a teenager who we've seen is fierce, and he's got the Golden Company and the Stone Griffin John Connington and all these other people behind him. Probably some Westerosi houses will rise for him after he's, uh, gets, makes some headway. In fact, that's extremely likely so that's another reason maybe to think of uh to, to not take this parallel too far but you definitely shouldn't discard it either a little more about Tommen because there's also marcella to, to be considered here now and just consider what would happen with an assassination publicly he's baratheon his heir is marcella but the valonqar prophecy says they're both doomed right but who inherits after them or does it even matter because if both of them are down um, maybe it implies that some army's already in King's Landing and they've been killed because the, the new regime, which is probably Fagon's, has taken over. But maybe not. And I also don't think that the Faceless Men are too likely to get involved with these two. The Sand Snakes, or again, Young Griff, are uh, one of his men, really, not him personally, are more likely to do for Tom and Marcella, especially the Sand Snakes. But you never know, you never know. Cersei here. Uh, she is perhaps the biggest target of all in terms of how she's behaved and the things that would get the Iron Bank to want to come after you. Again, no TV spoilers except to say it's clear Cersei's arc was heavily changed for the show. Some of the larger points could remain true, but others surely not. So any relationship she may or may not have had with the Iron Bank on the show should probably not count for much here. As it is with her children, the Valonqar prophecy says she will die at the hands of the little brother, and there are many interpretations of this, both the fan variety and issues with the translation. Most of us think it points to Jaime, and she, as we know, thinks it means Tyrion. Theories abound that basically include anyone who is someone's little brother, especially Euron, because there's just more and more pointing those two to getting together. But we don't need to get too deep with that. Huge it's shocker, and it's Tommen. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness Tom and murder Cersei <laughs> that would be a twist <laughs> uh, so we're not going to rehash those theories right now but the point is that if the Iron Bank sends a faceless man to kill Cersei the assassin could look like any one of these people like, like Tom and right <laughs> no I don't think so I would still <clears throat> bank on Jamie being the uh, the person to take out Cersei here, them dying together has been heavily foreshadowed. But a faceless man who looks like Jamie <laughs> sneaking in, the, like how do you get into Casterly Rock? It's so impregnable. Like, but if you look like Jamie, you can get in. <laughs> Might be a little hard to fake that golden hand though. So you're so by now you're like, okay, Aziz, you didn't tell us why they'd come for her. This already sounds a little tinfoil. Can I can I just say what you said there was that it would be harder to fake a golden hand than it is for someone to put on someone else's face. <laughs> well, in this That's case... the world that they live in. Yeah. I just, it's very comical to me. <laughs> the Iron Bank supplied the gold for the hand. <laughs> the, faces, no. the faces men have all that money sitting around. they got to use it for something. So, okay, so here's why, though. I, I, gotta, I didn't actually explain why the Iron Bank would, would have problems with Cersei. And it's not just because they're backing Stannis, because that's the, the straightforward part. But here's a little quote. I'll show you. The Iron Bank will have its due when I say they will. Whoa. Until such time, the Iron Bank will wait respectfully. Lord Waters, commence the building of your Drummonds. And that's to the objection of Meister Picel, who is, of course, generally pro-Lannister. But even he's like, whoa, I don't know about this, y'all. <laughs> like, are you really going to... You know, they're saying, right, the Iron Bank will have its due. And that's how she responds. She says, the Iron Bank will have its due when I say they will. Like, Jeez, you are something else, Cersei. And then when... An, and so after that, Noho Demitis, uh, an envoy of the Iron Bank, shows up, and she is super rude to him. She basically walks out on him. He, she throws jokes in his face and just kind of pretty much, you know, pisses him off pretty bad. So it's not long after this 
the Iron Bank changes their tune. They start calling in debts and refusing new loans all around Westeros. Well, not all around Westeros, which all around areas loyal to Cersei in Westeros, which is a lot of Westeros at this point. And that means merchants are having trouble getting money. And of course, this is simultaneous with Tycho Nestoris showing up to, to give money to Stannis. Because as soon as this is Cersei's just mismanagement of, of so many things here. She says she snubs the Iron Bank and immediately everything that's been said about what happens when you snub the Iron Bank starts to happen, except for, you know, assassins coming for her or anything like that. But they have been giving money to her, uh, her biggest enemy and giving him armies and, and the money to do that. So pretty important. So, but geez, here's where it gets a little tricky, but also kind of funny. Harry Swift. Okay. So in this, in the Dance with Dragons epilogue, they're trying to tell, they're talking to Harry Swift saying, hey, you might have to go to the Iron Bank or some of these other cities like Mir or Lee's to get loans. And he's all like whining about it. Like, do I have to? I didn't, this isn't my fault. And like, we know it's not your fault, dude, but this is your job. He's, I, that's a dude we'll, we'll not be, we won't miss when he dies. And for sure, Harry Swift will die <laughs> at some point. So Kevin and the others are, their goal is they're saying, hey, go there and placate them. Go there and, get loans from Mir and Lease and use that money to pay the Iron Bank or at least just smooth things over. Try to help undo the damage Cersei caused. Uh, and by the way, we suspect that the reason the Iron Bank or the reason that Mir and Lease say no and aren't letting, you know, aren't loaning people money to the same people that the Iron Bank won't loan money to is because the Iron Bank is so powerful that it's leaning on them. Say, hey, if you back these claimants that we're not backing, we're coming for you too. The Iron Bank is just so big and so powerful that the other banks kind of have to get in line like that. You, you don't want to be on the other side of the Iron Bank like that. But, so it's trying to untangle this knot here. After Kevin is killed, we see in the Mercy chapter that Harry Swift has indeed gone to Bravos to talk to the Iron Bank, but not with the original plan of going, them to, going to placate them. He's not there to follow the advice of Kevin and Mace Tyrell. Even Mace Tyrell knew not to do this. But now that Cersei's back in charge, which is apparent from the Mercy chapter, Swift has gone to Bravos to ask for more. Are you kidding me? <laughs> this is how just lost Cersei is at this point. The guards are, Arya's overhearing these guards gossiping about how not only is Cersei wants this money, but she's th apparently threatened Harry Swift to don't bother to come back if you don't get this money. And I do not think he's going to get it. <laughs> well, he's going to get it, but he's not going to get money. <laughs> he's going to get it. <laughs> and I mean, yes, death. So, but what are they going to say? Are they just going to be like, are you kidding me? Are you really asking us for money? Are they just going to like, laugh at him? Or are they going to kill him? I don't think they'll kill him, but, uh, but <laughs> they very well just ha may have a hard time not laughing him out. So that's just, that blows my mind that Cersei is just asking for more despite what she's already done. So that's going to have some fallout. I, I wonder how it's going to happen. There's Cersei has so many enemies and now her enemies have an enemy that can fund them, you know? <laughs> her enemies are now all potentially wealthier and more able to come after her because she pissed off the enemy that has all the money that's very willing to do whatever it takes. But let's move on from Cersei. Let's talk about Euron. It's interesting that the Faceless Men would come for him. I don't necessarily think they would, but we're going through all these possibilities. We got to throw that out there. But the idea that he already, you know, did a deal with them to kill Balon, that doesn't mean that they have some sort of customer loyalty program, right? And like, oh, well, you you hired us? We're not going to come after you. I don't, I don't think it works that way. I guess it might, but... But what if Euron steals a dragon, right? That might make him more of a target. I mean, they kind of already know he might be doing that, but maybe not. You know, it's unclear how much the Faceless Men know about Euron, except for what he's told them and what they've seen, what, what, what's obvious. But, you know, well, the Faceless Men aren't coming for Danny because of her dragons, at least not yet. But it, we pointed out maybe why, which is the mitigating quality of being a breaker of chains, whereas Euron is a maker of chains. She, he is a... Blue, he's a blue-lipped sorcerer pirate that is quite the enslaver. So if he starts to make real head waves, if he starts to like maybe reintroduce something kind of like slavery or brings thraldom to from, from the Iron Islands into Westeros, uh, I'm not saying he will, but if he does anything like that or, and or steals a dragon, especially if he does both, 
the Iron Bank slash Faces Men might uh, might have to pay attention to that. They might have to take notice and uh, do something about it. Now, this is where it may not be uh, an unknown Faceless Man. This is uh, a pet theory that maybe Arya will be the one to kill Euron. Maybe through an eye with Dark Sister, just like Daemon Targaryen did, also with Dark Sister in Aemon One-Eye's good eye. But that was on a dragon. Arya on a dragon is not so likely, maybe. But, you know, maybe she can take him out uh, somewhere else. Hmm. It's it's an idea. Another character who's pretty big in, in this book, Fire and Blood, is Rakalio Rindoon who to me is kind of like a, a little bit Euron without the sorcery, uh, maybe a bit uh, Dario thrown in. And if he tells us anything about Euron, well, Fire and Blood has him partnering with the Bravosi and Tyrashi to rule the Stepstones, and he demands tolls from all the ships passing through. Now, we've already got the Lord of the Waters, who is probably Orain Waters, doing something like this, uh, setting himself up at a spot called Torturer's Deep in the Stepstones. And uh, he might be doing this exact same thing, demanding tolls from ships passing by. That can't last, though, right? He's got a, f- a fleet of ten Dromans, and there's this... Danny's coming through with a gigantic fleet. Uh, Euron's got his huge fleet. There's the Red Wine fleet, which, if it survives its encounter with... <laughs> so if they were to maybe... Maybe Orain would would partner up with somebody. I don't know if he's... I, I kind of doubt he remains independent. So attaching his ten warships to a faction makes sense. And <laughs> maybe it'll be Euron. <laughs> maybe it'll be... Uh, Danny, who knows? Uh, but the, the, sur- surely the Iron Bank will, um, the, the, the if not Bravos itself, will be relevant to all this because anything happening in the Stepstones, if someone shuts down trade in the Stepstones, Bravos is really going to care about that. Bravos is a city of traders, of merchants, and they are they have the most powerful navy in the Narrow Sea. So uh, that would really both be something they could take care of because of their powerful navy and something that they would definitely care about because it would shut down trade to their city, which they depend on. So, lots to consider there. Let's take a few more questions before we move on to our last section, which is talking about the Sea Lord as a political figure and how he might direct the Faceless Men and or the Iron Bank into certain situations that might be, that we've talked about um, and some that we haven't. First off, from, from... Vampris 99 super chat house Targaryen before the doom was a minor house this is why I think the faceless men ignored them to the faceless men they didn't matter yeah well mm, I wouldn't say they were a minor house they were just minor compared to the other dragonlord families which which is to say compared to every other valerian family they were huge but yes amongst the so-called 40 dragonlord families they were uh, bottom 10 bottom 5 maybe but they weren't they were still pretty huge compared to all the other families but it's a it's a good point. It's still this point still holds, even though I've issued this little what I consider a correction here. She's still right. The Empress is still right that the Faceless Men, if they were going to kill any dragon riders, it wouldn't have during the uh, before the Doom. It wouldn't have been the Targaryens. It would have been someone higher up. But they apparently went the other route entirely, which was let's just blow them all up. <laughs> let's just kill, blow up these volcanoes, and then all the dragon rider families are gone. And then oh hey wait. One of these families got away. Hmm. Yep. Oh, well. Braun Holler says a faceless man can kill another faceless man if they don't know the face, maybe? That is possible. And because we don't even know the original identities of some of these people. Like, do we know? Like, when Arya is seeing all these faceless men and women sitting around a table, or they're, who knows what their real look is? Who knows if that's ever, po- who, who knows if, yeah. It, it depends on, you know, which uh, disciple or which, trainer <laughs> we, I don't, i'm lacking the right words here brought them in right the waif and the kindly man know what aria looks like because they entered they saw her at, at the beginning and it depends on how they kill them if they kill them in a certain way well then the other faceless man maybe has no way to ever tell them yeah but if, they're, if they come if they do it face to face in some way then they can pull out their coin or something the way they refer to it is i don't know this person so it isn't necessarily like a recognize I, I recognize might be a technicality that doesn't work here but it's it's a good question, though. It, it's yet another thing that, well, it's not like they have some sort of constitution of the faceless men that explains all these things. Well, maybe they do. We just haven't seen it. Another one from Van Paris. Uh, the Rogaris are George R. R. Martin's send-up of the Medici family. Their downfall is an allusion to the Potsy conspiracy. Yeah, I'm not super uh, familiar with the Potsy conspiracy, but absolutely recognized the comparisons to the Medici family. There's a lot of uh, proto-mafioso um, stuff in there as well. But yeah, certainly it's the banking family. Medici banking family is a big part of that. All the names are very Italian. <laughs> Rogare and 
uh, Lissandro and F- there's a Fredo for God's sake. You know, these are very Italian names. Drazenko. Drazenko. Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty I, cool. I have a mm-hmm. lot of fun when I say those names sometimes. <laughs> yeah. into it. I love the Italian accent. It is one of my favorites. It's mm-hmm. really good. It's so just, yeah. I don't even know the right word for it. It's just so, uh, it has so much flavor like Italian food. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Will Moss, night of the mid-afternoon, about 3.30, says, True, but I also think the Iron Bank is kind of a send-up of the Medici Bank itself. The fall of the Bardi Bank is also similar. Cool. See, this is one of the things I really, really love about uh, doing these some of these episodes live. Obviously, we, we, keep, we want to keep doing our scripted episodes. We haven't done one in a while, but we're not stopping that by any means. They're a little more efficient with the information, but the advantage of, of these ones is comments like this. Y'all are filling in blanks that I didn't even know to fill in. And this is valuable information. It really adds to the picture, and I, I just think it's uh, important to include. So thanks, y'all. Met Fan Man says, big fan doing the super chat to sustain the reread us. Well, I appreciate that, Met Fan Man. <laughs> even though I'm a Braves fan, we usually go to battle and baseball. But hey, we're, we're all friends here in the Song of Ice and Fire world. Uh, super chat from Captain Spaulding and Kevin Sparks and Matthew Underwood without questions attached. Thanks to y'all for that. And from Tony3483 says, tip your bartender at the Con of Thrones for me. You know I will. I always tip the bartenders. That is how we roll. It's uh, Those people deserve to be tipped. That's a hard job. All right. Uh, let's talk about, so like I said, this section is going to be called The Titan Must Have Three Heads. Yeah. Military and politics are the uh, the capstone to the banking and religion starts we've had and we can kind of tie all these together and see how it works natively the sea lord is a political figure uh, and the alliances he makes and breaks impact the state of the narrow sea and bravos as a a city state and and of course westeros and the free cities because of all the trade and the commerce and and alliances and back and forth things like that but the reason they're able to have such an impact is this military because of their navy is so big and powerful that's the key uh, it also makes sense that the Bravosi politics uh, would involve Westeros quite often. We've already spoken of the proximity to Bravos to King's Landing, but also Dragonstone, White Harbor, Gulltown. I mean, Bra- Bravos is closer to a lot of those places than a lot of other places in Westeros, or a lot of those places are to each other. I mean, I'm pretty sure it's about as far, actually, probably closer to Bravos from White Harbor than it is to go from White Harbor all the way down to Dragonstone or King's Landing. It's it's closer. Uh, It doesn't mean you have more reason to go there, but if you're just doing a bunch of trading, you hit all the ports you can to find the best deals you can. Bravos is going to be part of that if you're doing that northern trading uh, circle, so to speak. So it's uh, not only does it have a lot of plot importance, you know, Danny and Arya and Sam and Gilly, it seems likely to continue to have plot importance. And in fact, it may not have uh, had its climax as a location just yet. For example, recall the... uh, this uh, quote that we were bringing up earlier, actually, did we bring it up earlier? No, we didn't bring it up earlier. I think I have it. I actually moved it to later. No, no, we did read it earlier. Yeah, the one to share right at the beginning, the, the one about the very long one. Yeah, the very long one you read with the um, the the the, the assassinations being so coordinated and all that stuff. Well, <clears throat> I want to talk about the Sea Lord uh, and how he responds to some of these things. Um, let's see here. Where do we have it? Did I lose this quote? Go up to the basic bit of the outline. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, what we have here is, um, actually I see what I did here. I I meant to include something that I forgot to put in the document. No big deal. Okay. So the conversation with Septon Barth and the Sea Lord of Bravos goes a bit like this. He talks about how Oh, you're going to threaten me with dragon fire. Your, your king is very good at that. He's a good man. You know, he's a good ruler. He's good at, at, at this kind of backhanded threatening. Well, you know what? I can do that too. I've got the same ability. You know, we don't have dragons. You know, our armies are, you know, our ships aren't that threatening to you because you have dragons. But here in Bravos, there's this thing, you know, this, this organization called the Faceless Men, right? And he threatens, he, he, he makes a, it's not a joke, but he suggests that the Kingsguard who came with Barth is already dead. And Barth is like, whoa, he- hello, stands up. He's like, no, hang on, chill out. I didn't actually kill him. I was just suggesting, what if? And so that's like, whoa. <laughs> he's, it's a really, uh, it's a severe thing he's coming up with. He's saying, he's, he's basically threatening this envoy, but he's not. He's saying, oh, See, this is what you're doing. I'm not actually threatening you. I'm just doing what you're doing. I'm showing you that this is not a real threat. It's just a, it's a promise. 
And, you know, I can't kill all your armies, but what if, you know, a member of the royal family dies or, you know, a princess or a prince or something like that? So they they drop that threat. And the Sea Lord, the, the part that I really want to draw your attention to, though, is that the Sea Lord, then he goes to talk about money. He says, okay, let's trade. We can we can get, we can, no one needs to fight here. Let's just all get what we want out of this. You don't need your rocks back. You don't need your valuable stones back. They're just rocks, right? Who cares about that? Gold will do you so much more. He's just this very, uh, very salesman -y here, but he's also kind of right. And he brings up, he says, look, by the end of the deal, by the way it's negotiated, the Sea Lord didn't directly pay this debt. He got the Iron Bank to forgive the debt. It wasn't a debt to him. The Iron Bank forgave a debt to King's Landing on the behest of the Sea Lord. It wasn't his money. It's the bank's money. He asked them and they said, okay, we'll forgive this debt, this huge debt, this three dragon egg sized debt. And they just forgave it because the Sea Lord talked them into it. I mean... That's a little strange, isn't it? So to me, earlier we showed with the coordination of the death of the Rogares that it seemed very likely the Iron Bank was using the Faceless Men. That's the closest we've seen that kind of coordination. And now we have the Sea Lord just flaunting it, saying, I could send the Iron Bank, I could use the Iron Bank, or I could send the Faceless Men. Which do you want? He's acting like he has not control over, but sway, significant sway over either. Maybe he was bluffing. Maybe because the Faceless Men charge so much that he can't afford them because he's a Sea Lord and they'll demand a portion of, well, what? The economy? I don't, I don't know. His personal wealth? See, this is part of where it gets confusing. And this is where we also have to ask some other questions because the Sea Lord facing Daenerys has this really tight line to walk. Like we said, there's this whole slavery and dragon issue and he's like, well... Uh, I'm a political leader. Which side of this do I want to be on? Or do I want to, am I walking a fine line to see how it plays out? You know, what do people think? Do I, I don't want people to, to be really unpopular on either side of this. On the other hand, sea lords are elected, but they serve for life. So maybe sea lords don't always, they don't, you know, they're not worried about reelection in that sense. They can, they can go a little farther with some things because they're not, uh, uh, worried about losing their power as, all, as much. Now there are murders of sea lords that happens. And we have to ask ourselves which Sea Lord this is. It's a bit like the High Septons, though, where they just, it's not like they conceal their names, but we don't know their names. I mean, we do know some of them, but not enough of them to, to piece together much of a, a, a picture here. It's probably not the same Sea Lord currently in charge of Bravos who Danny lived with, uh, when, you know, with the House of the Red Door and all that, the one who oversaw the pact with Arianne and Viserys. But it could be, because again, they serve for life. But one of these, Sirio had to work for some Sea Lord, right? He, he said he was first sword, and he's not super old, Sirio is. So that means he probably, who whatever Sea Lord he served probably died, and then he just became a free agent of sorts, and that's how he ended up in King's Landing. And if he's ending up in King's Landing in, you know, 298, then probably the Sea Lord died a little while ago, and you know, rather than 20 years ago, which would be a, a whole different Sea Lord. So anyway, that's a little confusing, but the point is it's probably not the same Sea Lord, but it could be. If it is the same one, whoever he is, we're told he's supposedly dying. So either way, he probably won't be around to be a, you know, a, a, someone to spill the plans that happened in the background here. He won't be able to talk about Viserys and Arianne's marriage. He won't be someone to spill that probably. So regardless if it's the same one or not, it probably doesn't matter because this one's dying. Now, whoever the Sea Lord is, that's important, right? Because whoever this new Sea Lord is, whatever personality he has, whatever type of character he is, well, usually rising that high doesn't allow for a lot of moral, uh, you know, absolutism. You can't usually be like a, a super ethical guy to rise that high. This is something that Fire and Blood reinforces because we see a lot of different Sea Lords. I said that at the beginning. There's Sea Lords across various generations. We get lines like this one. Then, as now, the Bravosi were a pragmatic people, for theirs is a city of escaped slaves where a thousand false gods are honored, but only gold is truly worshipped. Profit means more than pride amongst the Hundred Isles. Aha! Uh -huh. That's pretty important. This is a, and remember, this is a take from years ago. This isn't a modern take, but it's probably still true because there's no evidence that Bravos has really changed that much. 
And this fits very much uh, with how the politics play out. Bravos treats the Iron Throne as a potential ally basically always. They never want to be enemies except for one or two cases. Even when the Iron Throne decides they want to break up this, this, uh, this union of Bravos, Rakalio, Rendun, and Tyrosh for the same reason that I suspect the Lord of the Waters is going to get in trouble, which is because they were trying to lock down the Stepstones as like a toll booth. And the Iron Throne doesn't want that. Now, of course, as I said, with the Lord of the Waters... He's doing it on his own or maybe with some help of other pirates. Bravos isn't involved. In this case, Bravos was involved. So you have a much bigger army slash navy holding this toll booth in place. And but what happens is, if you recall, Oakenfist does that sneak attack. And even though the goal was to undo Recalio Rendun, he attacked Bravos. And even though Bravos was allied at the time with Recalio Rendun. But Recalio himself didn't suffer a lot of damage, although he did indirectly. So what happens here is Oakenfist sinks so much of this fleet, and but Bravos doesn't escalate. They don't go to war. They say, look, y'all, we never wanted to fight you, but you're going to pay for this. You're going to, but not with blood. You're going to pay money for this. Just like with the dragon eggs, they're like, let's trade. You pay. You trade us the value of this affront rather than us going to war over it like a like a Westerosi probably would. Because... That's an exact quote, by the way. <laughs> hey, y'all. Hey, y'all. That's how Bravosi talk. Yeah. <laughs> and, but he, but he, but it's also, they do show the threat. They say, hey, look, we can, we can negotiate our way out of this problem, but let's show that we can be a problem to you if we want to. So he brings the envoys over and he shows them a galley being built in one day and boasts that they've already b rebuilt the entire fleet that Oakenfist sank. He's like, so y'all don't want to mess with us, but frankly, we don't want to mess with y'all either. So just give us money and we'll be fine. And that's what happens. They give them money. The, the Iron Throne pays them back for all those ships, but Bravos also sells everything else too. They say, oh, but you also want to pay us to not have an alliance with Tyrosh and Recalio Rendun? Okay, pay us for that. We'll, we'll drop out of it. I mean, it makes sense. They only got into this whole grab the step tones to be a toll booth business to get money. So if the Iron Throne's going to pay them to not take the toll booth, either way they get paid. That's the merchant attitude. Hey, as long as we get paid, doesn't matter how. And so we want to tie all this together here. The, the fortunes of the Sea Lord and the Iron Bank are somewhat intertwined. Uh, in this case, the bank doesn't face getting torched necessarily while the fleets of Bravos are another matter. So that's an example of how their interests could diverge. As a nation, they're together, but their interests aren't exactly the same because the bank just cares about getting rich. And the Sea Lord has all sorts of other political and, uh, you know, military goals potentially. So we have a, we do know the name of the guy who might be the new Sea Lord, Tormo Fregar, but... We don't really know any kind of man, what kind of man he is. And I suspect this is George R. R. Martin gardening here because Arya learns about this guy. She overhears people talking about him. And you would think that people would talk about what kind of guy he is, given that he's a candidate to be the next Sea Lord. But there's nothing. There's no detail. So I think George has left that open, which is important, very important, because he may decide, he may be considering, I don't, not that he has, let me back that up. I don't think he's not decided what kind of character this will be. I think he probably has it narrowed down to a couple of possibilities and hasn't settled on one yet. And I want to consider also how all of this, we've talked about, we've kind of built this up as we go. We started with the Faceless Men, we added the Iron Bank, now we're bringing in politics and military. Let's go one step further, and no, not the gods. That would be a fun one to bring up, but I don't have a lot to say about that right now. Unless you consider the others gods, and winter as a force of, of godly nature, because... What's going to happen there? A, a, a pl developing plot in the veil vale is Littlefinger playing the old cynical game uh, with food and profit, uh, trying to make the most money as he can off of grain by holding on to it until people are starving uh, and uh, you know selling to markets that are that are affected. So there, in other words, the idea that Littlefinger is planning to make huge profits from starvation. Well, I bet the Iron Bank is on that trip as well. Uh, maybe some of the other banks too, but of course the Iron Bank's going to be the biggest one. How do they deal with that? Do they, you know, try to 
make money the the most cynical way possible, like Littlefinger, or do they try to you know take a long view and say, hey, if all of Westeros starves, well, we're not going to be doing much business with them in the future if there's just no country there. You know, they don't they don't want Westeros wiped out, right? That's no one to do business with. That's not good for business at all. So they might. It wouldn't be you know it wouldn't be a compassion if they were to loan more money to more people to to feed themselves, but it would have the effect of keeping them alive, even if they wanted to get profit out of it. But as a share brought up, Bravos is pretty far north. What if winter comes to Bravos itself? I don't think the seas will freeze to to make a you know the narrow sea a big ice bridge, but Bravos is a city of canals, and those could freeze, right? The canals of Bravos could freeze. That's something that that makes more sense to me. And uh, what about grayscale? What so, if, that sounds lovely. Ice skating and the canals of Bravos. Yeah, yeah, that sounds kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, what about yeah? And what about grayscale or both? What are these things? What happens if they go to Bravos? Right? How does that affect things? Do the, what if there's a, a grayscale epidemic that impacts the actual faceless men? That seems unlikely, but they deal with a lot of corpses. Or what if some of the Iron Bank members get diseased? I don't know. These are kind of just random thoughts, but they're kind of fun. The, the idea is that there's a lot of personality or a lot of possibilities and personalities. Um, we might get more exploration of Bravos. Uh, Arya's in Mercy. She's you know going to doing her play and and going to you know kills uh, Raph the Sweetling and does all these other things. And we see one of the key holders in the audience. Uh, I didn't write down his name, but his house is um, mentioned, and he's a, his whole family is like Illyrio size. There's a bunch of and the implication is this is a family that's just been, you know, fat and happy for a long time because they're uber rich bankers. And uh, but the fact that they're being introduced a little bit is interesting and that there's, a, you know, Bravosi uh, people attending plays about things happening in Westeros. Interesting. OK, well, we're going to start to wrap it up here. I hope you all have enjoyed our run through of. The Titan of Bravos having three heads and uh, a little taste of um, winter coming their way as well. Uh, obviously, I didn't have a lot to say about the uh, the winter's impact there. I just wanted to throw it out as a possibility so you all to think about on your own. And if you have ideas, bring them up, send them to us, post them in our Facebook group, maybe bring them up on Flick. Flick app is, is doing great. There's really good discussions on there, most of them revolving around the reread project, but other stuff and, as well. And I, I have to say that... If you're coming to Con of Thrones, I highly recommend getting the Flick app. I think we'll be able to communicate very well with listeners at the con using that app is because you get notifications to your phone. I, I, I expect we'll be using it a lot. So this That's is a really the good time point. to use it if yeah. you're coming to Con of Thrones. Yeah. We'll have another stream before the con, but it's our Valor Rerita re stream. So just FYI. And, uh, It'll be a good way for History of Westeros people to find each other. That's a great that's point. That's what I'm saying. We already have a History of Westeros Con of Thrones thread, but I think we'll make maybe a, a new separate one that's for like communication there. I don't know. Cool. Anyways. Well, at one point, yeah, well, there's a History of Westeros live podcast at Con of Thrones, so at the very least we'll try to um, maybe help each other, talk about it at the con of how you all can help find each other. We'll, we'll maybe try to straighten that out uh, at, at, the, uh, at the site. <laughs> so um, let's see here. I'll give a couple of thanks. And um, work our way out of here. I hope, uh, yeah, like I said, I hope you all enjoyed this. It was really fun for me. I was just going off for the last few days, just taking down notes and thinking about this topic. It's just, I'm full of energy for these unexplored topics. Heck, I'm full of energy for the somewhat explored topics, but <laughs> this is uh, this is all, this, I, I'd, I'd say the, the unexplored, you know, still mysterious ones are probably a, a step or two above in terms of how fun they are. Um, you know, I just realized something I skipped over here. Um, let me just throw this out here real what quick. Did you, what did you skip over? I Let's skipped a little see. smart little thing here. The Septon Moon thing. I skipped, you know, oh, we, we talked yeah. about Septon Moon earlier and yeah, here's a little postscript to this because I, I, I was scrolling back up and I realized I missed it. So yeah, Septon Moon, there's a, Septon Moon is, is an example of the Faceless Men being brought up, but then dismissed because it said, oh, this was, it's too obvious. They were, they were, they weren't subtle. It was too sloppy. But I, I want to challenge that notion because Look at Arya's three wishes to Jockin. She 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 gives three kills from him. They weren't, I mean, they were sort of subtle. Two of them weren't pinned on a killer, right? They were, Weiss's dog was given basilisk blood, probably, which made it turn on Weiss and, you know, bite his throat out. Chizik was shoved off a wall, and you can't really say he didn't fall. No one saw it happen. But the weasel soup incident was the talk of Harrenhal, right? That was just a, 
everyone talked about the, you know, our, called her weasel from then on. Uh, so I don't know that the faceless men necessarily insist that all our kills must be uber subtle. And, you know, maybe the contractor can say, hey, I want this to look public. I want this to be in, in bloody. I want this to be noticed. I don't know that the faceless men would say no to that if someone asked. So, and people, as counter evidence that the uh, the murderer here was, may have been a faceless person after all, was the fact that they got away. The, the, the faceless, the, this, this woman, who well, maybe wasn't actually a woman, escaped. Despite, you know, despite the fact that it was this loud, noisy murder where this Septon Moon is running around, like, running to different fires, bleeding all over the place. <laughs> it's it still... She got away. So, you know, the assassin did their, maybe it was a little sloppy, but maybe, uh, maybe that was on purpose. Maybe it was meant to be uh, seen all over. Maybe they yeah, wanted the word some, to spread. Some, yeah, sometimes you do something like that because it's a message. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, like, you, it's still well done in that no one will ever get caught. There's no trace, nothing to follow and all that. And, be, and it's well done in that you made a mess. And here's the thing. If if it was the Faceless Men and they didn't want it to seem like the Faceless Men, well, it worked. Yeah. Because immediately people are like, oh, that can't be the Faceless Men. Yeah. Well, right there, that's suspicious that if people are dismissing the idea it was the Faceless Men, well, that's a reason to maybe think, oh, that's what they want you to think. <laughs> so maybe we're just getting a little too con uh, conspiratorial with that line of thinking, but... Eh. I just have to mention to anyone who watches Killing Eve that this has shades of that of like how well you kill someone and when you want to just like send a little message. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Okay, so some thanks as we're working our way out of here. Thanks very much to Ashea, who is the best for all the comments and production work and help reading the quotes and everything. Fantastic. Michael Klarfeld always gets a shout out except for the occasional time when I forget, but Ashe usually reminds me. Yeah. Uh, he has his new Dorn map out, claradox.de, K-L-A-R-A-D-O-X dot D-E. Check it out. It is fantastic. And uh, just like all his maps are. But, you know, I think each one's maybe slightly better than the last because he just gets a little better every time. Like, you know, that's yeah. the way things work, right? You get a little I, better I, at your craft. I do think Dorn is amazing, but, oh, Essos. Yeah, it's hard to top Essos, though, it's, just because of the scope and, yeah, and scale of it. It's, it's true. But it's fun to zoom in on locations, too. Yeah, you know? I love that. You can see the smaller details. Yeah, yeah it's, I love them all. Yeah, it's hard to, you can't really pick, we can't really pick favorites. I really like how Dorn has a, a sun spear. Yeah, the right. Of, of you know the city itself, so I think that's pretty damn. Cool. That is very cool. Yeah. Also, thanks to Joey Townsend and Jesse Kowal for our intro and outro music, respectively. And of course, big thanks to the still the the patrons that I haven't shouted out yet. There's a lot of y'all. Some of y'all don't uh, get shout outs because you want to be anonymous or because well, we can't have everyone get a shout out. It would take too long. But for those of you who pay up for that level, I really appreciate it. <laughs> we really appreciate it even more on days like this with the old roof news, but hey, we'll be okay. We're going to keep the content coming, and we hope you guys keep consuming it and sending us more ideas. So big thanks to the mysterious BR, Hand of the King, also to Lord Stephen Stark, titles, titles, Hand of Queen Ashea, who is known as the best. Y'all want to raise some awareness of, of his show, I Know That Nerd. It's a YouTube show where he interviews people around the Song of Ice and Fire fandom. And one of these days, uh, we'll be on it, not together, but separately, because he likes to, you know, get into it with each person, not uh, not groups of people. So maybe Ashea and Sean and I will each appear on there at different times. That's the thing to look forward to. Yeah. Lord Jim the Fortuitous of Wars and Politics of Ice and Fire is Warden of the West, and I'm doing a panel with him about fighting the others in uh, the Winds of Winter and beyond, how uh, mankind might manage to do that. Uh, we'll maybe post that one to uh, y'all who can't make the con afterward. I'd like to pull some of those uh, recorded panels and, and share them with you guys who can't make it, and that's a good candidate. Lord George Stormsville the Cunning is Lord of the Chiliad and Warden of the East. Cabeth the Unfrozen is Lord of the Bricks and Castle Crimson Light, Defender of the Old Gods and Warden of the North. Lady Kelly McMath of Covington is Lady of the Villa Hills and Crescent Springs, Warden of the South. Lord James Tuttle is King of the Stepstones and the Narrow Sea, Commander of the Royal Fleet, consisting of the Narrow Fleet led by the flagship Caraxes and the Bloodstone Fleet led by flagship Prince Damon. He's a brave man, Lord James Tuttle, but this, this talk of the Narrow Sea freezing over entirely is definitely uh, has him feeling a little anxious. However, King Beyond the Wall, Sidney Jesse, the fallborn Lord of Bluespring and the Haunted Forest, who wields a dagger of Dragonglass and the Valyrian Steel Blade, Red Frost, 
is uh, kind of encouraged by the notion that he could lead the uh, his wildling army somewhere other than Westeros. So, yeah, there's always two opinions. First Walker Tanneman is wielder of Blue Sister, went north of the wall in search of the most refreshing brew, where the mountains are always blue. Turned White Walker, but still in search for the elusive Blue Mountains. Can't rest till I complete my quest. Might be harder to find if the water freezes and you have even more places to search. Hmm. Our small council includes Lord Daniel, the sneaky Russian, master of ships, Grand Maester Via James, Lord Benjamin of House Hornwood, master of laws, Lord Fabian Flowers, the bastard of Green Shield, master of coin, and Lord Johan of House Orcos, called Shadowhawk, master of whispers. Lords and ladies in their castles include Lady Dire Liz of Castle Naki, the alpha patron. It's been a while since I explained what that means. She is the she was the first patron of our show, as well as History of Westeros and at least a few others. I I can't recall which, but. That is a, a well-earned title. Lord Dan of the Red Mountains and Castle, Break, uh, Castle Great Bell is Breaker of the Second Stone. Breaker of the Second Stone, it refers to the fact that he was his pledge is the one that took us past our second ever Patreon milestone, which was so long ago, I don't even remember what it was. <laughs> but it was something that was very uh, needed at the time, and we're very appreciative. Gregor the Toasty is Lord of the Breadfort. Lord Ryan of Castle Stonegate is Guardian of the Rocky Mountain Pass. Ashlyn Winter is the Hawk's Eye, Lady of Castle Skyfall. Lady Mikkel of Moonacre is leader of the Werewood Protectorate Alliance. The Lord of the Halls of Castle Hillcrest is wielder of the Valyrian Steel Machete Everglazed. Lord Alistair Whitaker is Lord of the Dawnhold. Lord Bemmy Snuggle Bunny is Guardian Ranger of the Hidden Hundred Acre Werewood, dual wielder of Valyrian Short Swords, Glorious Morning and Little Light Wise, and sharpshooter of the Werewood and Ironwood, Laminated Longbow, Todd Von Oben. The Bastard of the Wolfswood is First Forester of the Old Gods, Sworn to House Iron Werewood. Listen for the silence. Lady Liana Kelly of Wolf Island is Protectress of the Steelhold. Casey Stark is of House Acres. Lady Kay of House Archer is Lady of Earthdog Hall, Huntress of the Wolfswood, and Guardian of Maddie Squirrel's Bane, the Mighty Direweenie. Lady Raywin of House Dillsdane is the Star Spear. Peter Rivers is the Pale Dragon and heir to Blood Raven. King's Justice Sir Troy the Steady is wielder of the Valyrian Steel Blade Fate. And the, the Queen's High Council has Bloody Ben Blackwood, Master of Whispers. Rebea Star Eyes, Lady of Waves and Mistress of Ships, Captain of the Iron Shadow Cat. In the shadows, we bear our claws. Catrin, is it Catrin or Catrin? I think it's Catrin. Catrin, Catrin, the wise of House Trondheim, master of coin. Grand Maester Elizabeth, middle daughter of Lyanna Mormont, first lady to forge both the silver and Valyrian steel link. And Laura Boros, the lady of infinity, master of laws. Oh, yeah. Our King's Guard is led by Lord Commander Miriam Arm, backed up by Sir Dollarus D, longest tenured White Sword, Sir Dean the White, Knight of the Black Star, Sir Jord of House Pepsi, the Beverage Knight, Gregor Snow called Snow Bear, a bastard of Winterfell, Sir Glennon of House Leanne called Lion Cloak, and Sir Jen Seaworth is Knight of the Southern Snows. But the, the Queen's Guard is led by Lord Captain Commander Hema Helminth, the Sellsword Sentinel, has Alexander of House Atreides from the Seat of Dune, I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Becca the Bard, songbird of the north. Michonne the Melodious, star of Old Town. Minds over masters. Ser Rambo, knight of House Ganon, first blood. First blood. <laughs> Ser Leon of House Walker, wielder of the twin Valyrian steel blades, fire and ice, and the weirwood bow, rain. Amber the Adamant, the knight of the mist and mother of squids. Oh, yeah. Our beard guard includes Lord Commander George the Golden at the, at the helm, backed up by Sir Joshua Oakhart, the White Oak, Lady Rita of the Copper Man, the Unbound, Dance the Fervor, Sir Jeff Warden of the AC, Wielder of Triad, the multifaceted beard of Platinum Red and Brown, Stay Frosty, and Sir Tim Corgyle as Mad Boy of the Western Desert. I'll throw out a few new ones here that don't normally get shout-outs, but I just like some of these names, so, you know, let's do that. We've got Sir Mikkel of House Redwood, wielder of the Valyrian Steel Blade, Forest Fire, and a Redwood Longbow. That's fire with a Y, of course. The Black Ash of House Reed is wielder of the quarter staff, Fraxinus Nigra. Lisa is Water Witch of Dorne. Archmaester Zygmunt is astronomer and minstrel of the, Cit of the Citadel. Uh, also, shout outs to Bailey Bloodaxe, the Warrior's Chosen, Lady Brock of House Black Tree, the Badger King, Sir Raywin Hill, Bastard of the Rock. Uh, just a few more here. How about Sir Seth Copeland, Knight of the True North, Strong and Free, Lady Lakshana, Shield of the Sages, Josh the Dark Knight, Rickard the Regal of House Grimlock, Victory Has No Room for the Weak, Lady Chelsea the Blonde Wolf, Mistress of the Western Slope, 
or the Blonde Wolf, Mistress of the Western Slope. Those are two separate statements. <laughs> and last but not least, our members of the History of Westeros Night's Watch. Lord Commander Benjamin Umber, the Silent Giant, wielder of the Valyrian Steel Greatsword, Winter's Kiss. And first builder Magor Snow, a.k.a. Magor the Cool, the Fire in the Snow. First steward Sir Jurion of the Torrentine, called Pale Wind. And first ranger Sir Source Delica of House Gramercy. Thanks, y'all. We will catch you next time. Remember, we have two monthly live streams, Tuesday, a Tuesday and a Saturday, generally the last Saturday and first Tuesday. That's occasionally subject to change, but that's the rough schedule going forward. And of course, Valor reread us almost every Sunday at three. See you for one or both of those. Until next time, for Shea, Valar Reredis.